Welcome to Discover Indie Film. I'm Jeff Howard, and I've got Adam Peltier with me. Adam is in my home. We're in the guest room. I wasn't invited, but I am his. I'm in his home. He's, no, you pet the rabbit, so you are totally that. that you were invited by by the rabbit, and that sounds like something else. You know, it does sound like pet the rabbit. So. Adam is here because his film Space Jump mm-hmm. was at the Sherman Oaks Film Festival just about a year ago, 2022. And I'm going to name your awards. You got the Grand Jury Award for Best Short Film Art House Experimental. Ooh, well, but then you also won two awards from the Filmmakers Board. The Filmmakers Board gives away the Filmmakers Awards. And that board is filled with people who had films in the festival previous years. So it's an award from your peers, which I think means more. Yeah, in a way. it does. And they gave you... Well, they gave you Outstanding Screenplay Art House Experimental Boom And Outstanding Performance by a Cast Yeah, oh, that's awesome Isn't that a rad award? I'm so glad we do the full cast award I love that because I do think I am biased But the cast and Space Junk crushed it It's just a really creative film It's, 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 uh, what's I don't know, avant-garde I never know what to call it No, yeah, it is But it's an art film It's A hundred percent You, you, you you totally push the boundaries. And so it must be even a, so an award like that means a lot because it means that like everyone on your team got it. You're also, you know, you okay. probably, I could name, <laughs> you know, writer, director, producer and all that, but, but yeah. I'm sure but you wore go, even go more ahead. hats. No, no, no. I mean, when you make an indie short, the number of, you know, it's always funny. I know most filmmakers are like, I don't want to like list everything I did. Cause yeah. at that point you seem petty <laughs> yeah no you seem like a crazy person but it's funny because uh for for space junk i didn't list like everything that i did in fact um, you didn't list yourself as producer now i see yeah 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 yeah, you're, yeah. You're Meyer hamden yes that's right yes yeah that was a friend of mine um, but you probably did a lot of producer jobs and just said but i'm not putting my name there yeah no i, I just didn't seem like i want I, I don't know i was like it just seemed like it just made more sense to do it the way we did it but this this other film i have me and my friends, we, we listed like every job that we did because we were so proud of ourselves. And we thought it was really funny to see like, oh, the guy that played this character was also the makeup artist and was also this. And like, because that's what you do with these indie films. Like you are, you do, you do everything. Everyone does everything. You either got to like go so far that it's fun or, or just do it respectable. Yeah. I yeah. do. I do have an amusing theory that I shouldn't share publicly, but I'm about to, which is that <laughs> When I'm watching screeners for the festival, yeah. if it starts off with a, uh, I'll steal from Steve Martin, a Gern Blanston production of a film by Gern Blanston, written and directed by Gern Blanston, and then the title, like, if, I, if you see that writer-director's <laughs> name three to four times before the film title, yeah. it's going to be a piece of shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's pretty bad. At least come up with a production company name other than, like, you know... Gurn Blanson Productions. Yeah. Like, come up with something creative, like uh, Big Duck Pictures. You know what I mean? Big Duck Pictures, <laughs> which works. I'm a big fan of the ducks. Yeah, you know, we like we like ducks. Ducks are cool. Ducks are fun. And when you're putting it into your socials, it could be mistaken for something else if there's a typo involved, so then it could lead you down an inappropriate rabbit hole. <laughs> oh, my God. I didn't even think about the big yeah. fuck possibility. Yeah. By the way, yeah. cursing is completely encouraged. Oh, good, good. Well, I was even thinking big dick, like, because then it gets you, oh, it gets you duck, kind of big dick, fuck, right. big dick. It could send you down the wrong, bring up the wrong Google images, or the right ones, depending on what you're looking I for. I like it. I like it a lot. <laughs> All right, well. Congratulations on a great film. Thank you so and much. We will talk about your next film because I've seen it because That's right. it's, and you uh, hate it. And you- <laughs> it was uh, I did that thing where I was like, oh fuck, another good one. I will, I'm going to send him an email because I just I just felt like it. And I think I knew we were going to record this. Yeah, I think it was. You're like, hey, by the way, that movie was good. Also, I need you to come over to my house to pet the rabbit. And <laughs> it is the t- <laughs> if only I had a big duck for you to pet. If only. Ducks love me. <laughs> I should have named the rabbit Duck instead of Winston, because then it'd be like, you want to pet the duck? That would be actually really, it'd be funny and confusing. His name should be like. The Duck. The Duck. I might start calling him The Duck. He's, he's duck-like. Uh, he is in every way. All right, so how can people see uh, Space Junk, which we're going to talk about a lot yeah. uh, when we get to it, but you're going to give your life story first. But of course. They can, it is going to be on TV High. Yes. We're going to get that Woo. done. We're going to get... We're signing our, the deal. We're signing we're the signing. papers. This is the meeting right here. So if people go to watchtvhigh.com or 
And of course, I am responsible for TV High, so yep. I have an in there. I know a guy. You know a guy. I know a guy. <laughs> He's not but a great guy, but you know a guy. <laughs> if you know how to deal with him, you can get what you need. <laughs> but uh, so, P- and TV High is a streaming platform. It's, mm-hmm. it's a smart TV app on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Android TV, Apple TV, Android Mobile, and iPhone Mobile. And if you watch movies on your phone, you're a lot younger than I am because I can't even handle the idea. Yeah. And well, you're watching movies the right way on your phone. <laughs> I've, I have seen our almost 16-year-old sitting on the couch in front of a 65-inch screen watching YouTube on her phone. And I'm like, or Netflix. And I'm like, that's a T, that's uh, bigger is better. She's like, no, I like it better on my phone. I'm like, okay. And then <laughs> I turn into grandpa. At that yeah, point, I yeah. go from like. I, I become, you become just like, a dinosaur going, yeah. it shouldn't happen. Yeah. Got to respect the form. You become the guy that's like, get off my lawn type of dude. And it just, it just comes out because you're uh, Plus the quality of the speakers. I know. I know. I know. It breaks something. my heart. It breaks my heart. So please watch Space Junk. You can check it out on TV High on any of those platforms, TV HI, or mm-hmm. if you just go to watchtvhigh.com. By the way, streaming service, uh, if you use the code STREAM420, boom. By the way, TV High is sort of meant to, it's just great indie films. Mm-hmm. But if you enjoy cannabis, they're even better with such uh, assistance. <laughs> and you really needed to get through my movie. And, and if cannabis, no, you don't. I, I still haven't seen Space Junk Stone, but I'm yeah. looking forward to it. Good, good. Because I have a feeling maybe I'll understand it better than ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I like, think I do understand it. I think you do. After watching it 30 times, you're like, ah, it kind of makes sense. Now. What the, <laughs> at the theater, that's one of the great things about the film festival is I see the films as a member of the jury, mm-hmm. selection jury. But then I get to watch it in a theater with an audience and then talk about it afterwards. So it's, you know, I get that second viewing in and you really pick up more. Totally. And it's always fun to watch it with an audience, too, because some things might be funnier or more dramatic or whatever because the audience's vibe and everything. One of the reasons why our festivals, the awards are announced a week or two after the festival instead of at the festival is I, for one, will not submit my ballot until I've seen them at the theater with an audience. Yeah, I think that's smart. Yeah. I support this. Continue doing this. I mean, obviously, people love the fact that, like, maybe at the closing ceremony, they hand out trophies then and there, like, sure. in person. Some but... People, yeah. Fuck that. You know, everyone deserves... I, I, I personally, I don't want to decide which film is my... Who I'm going to vote for yeah, right. until... You should need to, you need to see with the audience and then the awards things, you know. Yeah, And I'm bigger? Not, yeah. A bigger screen... Helps. Can help. If you're going to decide cinematography based on watching it on a 65-inch TV versus... Well, it's 65-inch TV is pretty, pretty good pretty these big. days. That's good, yeah. But it helps to see it on something bigger. You can appreciate it more. If it's especially it's down to... You know, two or three films. Yeah, yeah, seriously. I mean, although, yeah, we're we're cool. But anyway, so that's yeah. so that's the deal with Space Junk. People can watch it there, and we're also going to throw it on uh, Discover Indie Film, the TV series that is there. It is short films handpicked from the festival circuit. This is breaking news right now. All Fucking this, hell! All this we're like breaking news. We're at like ten minutes, this and we is, haven't even gotten God, to your first question. Who cares about me? We just know where they can watch the movie. Well, a lot of people <laughs> care about you. I, I think that's my mother, my father. They'll listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> Will they listen to this? Should we not curse? I don't, yeah, no, we can't. We can't. <laughs> or should we? I, I promise not to say uh, any of the horrible. We were we were trading un, unrepeatable jokes before oh, we yeah. started recording. Very, very much so. <laughs> and thank God we weren't recording. <laughs> but I hope he's okay. So, <laughs> first question mm. and only question is, so I've seen two films that you've written and directed yes. and starred in and... And so you clearly, uh, and so you, and you're doing great work. So I clearly have an ego. Is what you're about to say? No, <laughs> tip of your tongue. <laughs> no, I was just where did it come from? Because it's like you know, did you get into acting first? Did you get into film first? Were you inspired as a kid? Were you an artsy kid? Were you a writer? Like what? Yeah. How did you be? You know, you're. I always say the hardest fucking thing in the world is being an indie filmmaker because it really is. Sisyphean. I mean, it, it's just, it's just like, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. I'm gonna pour my heart into something, and I'm really doing it for the love of the game. I'm doing it for the love of the art, because you know, you certainly can't turn to your 
your your spouse or your parents or anyone in your life, even your best friends, and go, I'm making a uh, an artistic short film, and I have a hunch I'm going to be able to buy a house when I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> like, I wish that was the case. Like, but nobody it's not ever, the case. like, you know. If anything, doesn't... it's like, uh, you know that house we were saving for? We're going to have to wait a little bit longer because I'm going to be taking some of that. a fraction of the down payment. <laughs> we're going to have to work an extra six months. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. No, it is. It's tough. So so what got you into the, uh, what? When, when did you fall in love with it? Yeah, you know, it's kind of a weird uh, journey for me because I wasn't one of those kids that grew up doing like performing arts, theater, any of that kind of stuff. Movie, I, I wasn't doing any of that. I mean, I grew up in small town, Ohio, kind of like we were talking a little bit before. And the only thing we really had there, I mean, it's a very, very, very small farm town, southern Ohio. And we had like, you know, a movie theater. And so from a young age, I mean, I was obsessed with just like watching movies. Um, and I remember like some of the earliest memories like my parents have of me as a child, I guess, would be like I was obsessed with like 101 Dalmatians. And like when I could get up and sort of walk, I could work the VCR. And so when it was because it was a VHS tape dealio. So when the movie would be done, they'd put it on, they'd leave me in the, the room or they'd be nearby. They were good parents. So wh- whatever a good parent does with the, when the child at a certain age, um, they were well, watching a G rated film. So that's- I, yeah. 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 So it's all good. And, and so like, I'd sit there in my diaper with like a bottle. And then when the movie was done, I would just get up, waddle up, press rewind. And I would watch, cause that, then you could watch the movie rewind really, really fast. Like back then, uh, and which I loved, and then I just press play, walk back, and plop my butt down and watch this movie on like repeat. So there was like already a fascination with movies. Um, and then again, yeah, when I got older, my sisters were really into theater and like performing arts and all that. And I just, I never, I think I was, I was think I was kind of shy and a little nervous uh, about performing in front of people. Um, but my favorite thing to do was to go to the movies. We had a really small movie theater. And I would even, my parents would take me to, you know, rated R films at a young age. I remember like seeing like, you know, they would take me to see like, I saw like a long time ago, like Gladiator and like uh, Saving Private Ryan, these movies that like, I guess, I don't know why my parents took me to see these, probably because they wanted to see it and they didn't, they couldn't find a babysitter. Yeah. And they were like, hey, you'll be, you're mature enough. You're, you're going to be fine. Um, and they were no like, no kid was ever broken by a film. No, I, I, you know, I don't think so. You know so. what I mean? Yeah. And they would close my eyes at certain things and stuff. And so we'd go see these big blockbusters and it was so fun. Um, and then even as I got older, again, I would go to the movie theaters instead of like going out and like, you know, partying and stuff like in high school, cause there's not a lot to do in like a f- small farm town. I'd go to the movies by myself and just see tons and tons of films. So that was like my fascination, but it seems so out of reach, man, to like, to make movies. Like, I don't think I, I like was understand, I mean, I understand the concept of like how to make a movie because I would buy so many DVDs and Blu-rays at this point and then like watch all, like that, at a certain point, like early 2000s, it was like special features were incredible. Yeah. The DVD extras <sighs> were, it's another thing we lost with streaming because yeah. Now you have to hunt down those extras. Yeah, there were some like just incredible, incredible like making of like behind the scenes. And you really understood. I remember like, you know, like seeing like this is going to sound so insane. But like I was like a big Rob Zombie fan at a certain time. And I think he's like, I do think he's like an incredible director. Even though he's got a lot. He's got misses. You might not like the vibe or whatever. But he had for like the Devil's Rejects. He had like this incredible behind the scenes. It's like an hour and a half documentary of like how they went about making this film. Um, so like I was obsessed with all that stuff. So I kind of understood the concept, but it seems so far out of reach to do. Um, and at that time, so I didn't know what I really wanted to do. And I ended up uh, going to, I got into United States Military Academy, West Point. So wow. got into West Point. That's but a I, wow. But a, by the way, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah. I, yeah. I, I want to interrupt. Please do. And ask, uh, um, a Mark Maronic, Mark Marin style question. <laughs> there we go, please. Uh, a Marinism. No, because you mentioned your sisters. Mm. What about birth order? Oh, I'm Where, the youngest. I'm you're the, the youngest. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, so, yeah, so yeah. yeah, so they were kind of leading the way, and you were, you were. Uh, yeah, and they, when they would do like show choir and stuff, and I just, I don't know, I felt like so shy to like get up and I couldn't sing, I couldn't dance. Um, 
and all, and, and my school didn't do like plays. It was a very small school. There was like sixty people in like my, my graduating class, maybe less. And so like they would do like musicals, and it, so like there was just never even an in for me, and there was no film like club or anything, right? And there weren't like video cameras laying around the no. house to pick up and play with. Yeah, no, because my my parents incredible parents but they weren't like artsy like you know my dad was like they're both blue collar you know people like my dad was a firefighter and a paramedic and my mom would like you know she was a stay-at-home mom and then she would like clean houses and stuff like so like very much like no no arts but they were like encouraging of whatever anyone wanted to do you know and and my sisters kind of gravitated towards that um more so than than me i think again i think it just goes back to this being so shy Right. You know, like I was outgoing but when it came to performing. I felt like, I don't know. I was just like so nervous. Um, so, yeah, there just wasn't that thing. And then being the baby and seeing them and my sisters like do a really good job at singing and dancing. I was just like, I don't know if I can do that. Um, and so, yeah. So like, and then, and then when you're in Ohio, too, it's like and not ragging in Ohio, but like it was so like I, the, the options were so in my small world. Right. The military made the most sense. Uh, but I was happened to be I'll toot my own horn, kind of smart, like as as far as studies go. So I was able to get in, again, yeah, West Point, right? But I had to go to yeah, play. that's prestigious. It's a big, it's a big, it's a yeah, big deal. No, yeah, you it's, gotta you, know, you gotta have a good ACT score. Or whatever. You gotta yeah, you gotta be a you little can't bit of be a, brain. a club. Yeah, yeah, gotta it's be, not it's not enlisting. Yeah, it's not enlisting, right? Oh. So you have the brain, you have the brawn, you have to have you have to be an athlete as well. So it was like kind of a big, it was a big deal. Um, and I knew that's like, at the time, that's what I wanted to do. And, and I'm like, this makes the most sense. But before I could go, because each state only takes like a couple, they take like maybe depending on your population or whatever, or the districts, how it works out. Right. They take maybe like one or two people per state. Sorry, do you even need like some local congressman to write yeah. a letter? Yeah. So I had to get my congressman's, uh, uh, approval. So that, that, that's a whole crazy thing. You go through all these interviews. How dumb and antiquated is that? Yeah. The idea that our congressmen have any clue, yeah. like, what gems there are in their town. Like, yeah. no way. They don't know anyone who votes for them anymore. I mean, there's like no way. I mean, it, it, but here's the thing. It, and it's insane because you're a kid and I have like no kind of concept of like a lot of things at this time. And you have to go in for like an interview with this with this person, but they have like a team of like lawyers and stuff and they're asking all these questions and stuff. And like, it's an insane experience. And then you get to meet the person. And like the Congress, the Congress person I had was uh, um, John Boehner. Uh, and he was Speaker of the House at the time. Yeah. Which is kind of You were from Boehner's district. Yeah, man. Shit. <laughs> He's crying all the time. Was, <laughs> did, did he have a scotch? Did he have a scotch while he talked to you? Um, he did not have a scotch, uh, but he was very, very tan. He had that. He's beautiful known for his tan. tan. Beautiful, beautiful tan. Um, and didn't get emotional with me. Which is another thing. People are like, wow, this is a John Boehner podcast. No, no, but it's Boehner has this bizarre place in our culture now. Yeah. As like the kind of Republican we miss. Yeah, yeah. Like a guy who would do deals. He'd get drunk with the other side. He just, he fucking, you know, he was a hard ass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he believed in it and he got shit done. I think so. I think, right? Or I guess he's, yeah, he did. And and, and he has the best last name ever. Yeah. Boehner, not to be mistaken with anything else other than Boner. Boner. (laughs) B-O-E-H-N-E-R. Yeah. Yeah. Insane. Um, but he, and he was interested. He probably, he probably wanted to sponsor you just because your last name is Peltier. So Boehner Peltier. Yeah, it just felt right. You know, Uh, you should (laughs) have, if only you'd married his daughter and made Boehner put Peltier. That's There's not still a time. bad. There's still time. There's, there's what are we talking about here? Yeah. Come on. What's happening here? Um, but he was, he was an interesting guy and I met him twice. Um, and then I, but before, so there's a the thing though with this, the, they'll sometimes have like a lot of exceptional uh, people they want to put forth to West Point. And just because you get nominated doesn't mean you get in. Right. Um, but there, there was a number of exceptional people in, in my district of Ohio, I guess. And so I had to wait. I got accepted, but I had to go um, to military prep school for a year. Because like, hey, you'll get in, but you got to wait because of just the right, numbers. Kind of like a gap year. And you and during that gap year, yeah. you went to like, yeah, whatever, the to, the, the I went to pre-law, whatever. Yeah. Pre-law for law school, pre, if only. pre-West Point. If yeah. only. But pre-West Point for me was in Marion, Alabama. Marion Military Institute. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, was that a culture shock? Oh yeah, it's insane. I mean, it was like because Southern Ohio is not. I mean, that's almost 
I mean, but, it's, it's but farm it's town. It's, it's, yeah. different, it's, it's definitely a different culture, different vibe. And um, it was it was just interesting. I'd never really been. It's my first time kind of away from home, too. And to go to Alabama, I went from a really, really small town to an even smaller, smaller, I don't want to say weird, but just an odd environment. Because I haven't really, I hadn't been around the military, really. You know what I mean? There was no, I mean, I guess there was an Air Force base near where I lived, but like, it just wasn't a thing. So it was so odd being in this like really, really small town. And there was like, and Marion was like, you know, there, there's, it's like historical. It's where the civil rights march started and stuff. So there's like, there's like history there, but it's, it's just so small. It's a small little place. And this military school doesn't really interact with, at least my time there, we weren't like interacting with the community so much because it, it's like, you're there for either, you know, you're there because this is the college you chose, um, or you're there because you're one of these like West Point's uh, Air Force Academy, Naval Academy um, prep students, and so you're there, and like you're just you're you're on campus nonstop. You have all these classes you have to take just to keep your grades up to make sure that you're up to snuff with West Point standards. You don't lose anything, and you're right, right. So there was a l- there was a bit of pressure because even though you were already in, if you effed up, oh yeah, you'd be you'd lose your spot. A hundred percent, it'd be like a waste of time. Because again, nothing against Marion Military Institute, but it's like not that's not where I wanted to go to school. You know what I mean? It's actually I will give them this. It, it seems like it's gotten better. Like it's actually like. You know, so good for them. I guess I think they have some good donors. Um, but uh, yeah, so you have to keep up. You know, you're doing like a lot of engineering classes, a lot of like it, it's a pretty intense thing. And then you also have your military training on top of that. Uh, but it's funny. So when I'm down there, they at this school, they have a they do have a theater program. Oddly enough, you go to this this. Yeah, but but they got a big. Obviously, a bigger student population than you'd ever been in. Yes, right? yeah. for sure, for sure. Still very so that, small, so that but can support a theater yeah. I, program. Yeah, hundred percent. And 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 there's this theater program there, and it's ran by you know this this woman. Her name was Colonel Street, Colonel in the I believe the United States Army. I don't know. I'm pretty sure she was in there. There's because there's naval guys there yeah. uh, as well. But they they would be it's Colonel in both. I think no, yeah, if I was yeah, knowledge yeah, and I true. Not, no, you're so right. I'm but like I know blanking, there's different. Like, there's like you know, this? Yeah. admirals and generals and yeah. blah, blah blah. Like they have because <laughs> I'm it makes this sense. All up. I didn't serve it makes in the sense to have all no, this division. You're so right. You're so right. What am I thinking? I always like. <laughs> so she was a colonel. And she was surely yeah. army. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She was in the army, and and so she was running this program. And I remember, like you know, at the time, West Pointers couldn't we couldn't deviate from our our, our classes, right? Because we had such a big workload. And I just, I remember seeing a play. I don't know why I saw it because some people in the company were in it, you know. Um, and I was like, oh, wow, this is really bad. I should just do this. Like, I should I should audition because it's like, what's there to lose? Like, So the quality was so low, yeah. there was no danger. There was no danger, yeah. I felt like I could maybe embarrass myself and no one will see it. So why not, right? And I this time you're also, I was watching a lot of movies still again just because Netflix was kind of becoming more of a thing. Um, so still obsessed with like movies and stuff, but that seems so not doable. But acting in a play, maybe. And so I go and ask if I could go audition. They say no because of all the, the course load that we have. So I'm like, whatever, fuck it. I see where they have the um, the notice for like when auditions are going to happen. And I learn a monologue, which I've never learned before. I don't even know what I learned. Um, and I go and I audition, uh, audition for this. And I go out there, I do the monologue, I'm done. And Colonel Street's like, uh, listen, honey, you're not, who are you? What are you doing here? And I'm like, I'm one of the West Point people. And I'm like, ah. she's like, oh, God. Okay, well, you did really good. So I'm going to have to talk to somebody because, you know, I want you to be the lead of this play. And I was like, what? This is crazy. Yeah. And uh, so she talked to the, the guy that was in charge. I'm blanking on his name. So so her tone was about what she was going to have to go yeah. through to get you. Yeah. She was already <laughs> saying to herself, this guy's ah, good. fuck, it's going to be worth it, but I got to deal <laughs> yeah. with those assholes. Yeah. Yeah. I got to deal with red tape. Yeah. All the red tape. To, to get to, to actually have a good play with a good lead. Yeah. 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 For, for the, for the school. You know what I mean? Like at the time I was, I guess I was the best. Um, and I, she went through all the red tape. I was in it, and it was great. And when I, after I do this performance, uh, Colonel, uh, no, Commander Stevens, Commander Stevens, who was like chemistry science guy, he comes up to me, and and I'm like not, 
I was like kind of struggling with, I mean, I, I got into West Point, but it was like some of the stuff I just wasn't into anymore. Um, and I wasn't doing great in his class. I mean, I had an A, but like I, I could have been doing better. And, um, that's like the military side of me coming out. Right. <laughs> like a 93% A is not as good as a 97% yeah, A. What am I doing? Um, and he comes up to me, he's like, you know what? You should do this. And I was like, whoa, that's awesome. I'm like, I don't know if that's a dig, meaning like I'm not good at this military thing, so I should do this. But it stuck with me. And and it, it really I, – so I decided to go to West Point, though, to see that through. Um, and I go there, and I was miserable. I wanted to do that. I got the, I got the acting bug. I got bit by it at, at Marion Military Institute. I had a really miserable time at West Point. Um, God, yeah, and they have no theater at all. They they might have some sports. Yeah, but. they have sports. They, they had a theater club, and I went to that. And the higher ranking, you know, students, uh, the the upper class classmen, they they get all the parts and stuff for whatever reading you're doing. And I was like, ah, oh, fuck this. This is so dumb. I'm like, I'm not wasting my time here. And then at this time, too, man, you know, it's like we're in Iraq and Afghanistan, and I'm like, I just became so. You know, it's my, my, again, another time I haven't been away from the, my home that long. Like I'm out in the world. I'm like forming these opinions, asking questions. And it just all felt wrong. Like being there at West Point and like we're in Iraq and Afghanistan. That's where I was going to have to go after I um, was done at West Point. I'm like, you know, this, I just, I don't believe in what we're doing there. Um, and I can't, there's no way I can, I can, cause when you graduate West Point, you become a second Lieutenant. Yeah. Yeah. You become an officer and you, you, yeah. yeah. And I'm like, there's just, there's no way I can in good faith, like do this. Cause I just so do not believe in what we're doing. Right. The reality of it kicked in. Cause also you were, you'd have the, the, the gap year thing or the the prep year. So by then you're 19, 20. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a big difference between like 20, like those two years from 18 to 20, it's still like 10% more life. Yes. Yeah. A hundred percent. And it, and it, and, and you kind of have this, you start forming these opinions, asking questions, you know, that maybe you didn't so much um, when you're like in the comfort of your home, your small town. Right. It just all seemed kind of wrong for, for me. Right. You know? And so, I mean, like long story short, I got, I got honorably discharged from the United States army. Um, I was able to leave West Point early. Um, and, and then I got into performing arts school. I mean, so, yeah. so you, did you leave and then, or was it more like a transfer? No. So essentially what happens is like, I, I was just so miserable there. I wasn't do. I was near the bottom of my class academically. I wasn't showing up to classes, was doing penalty hours. I was like getting in the fights with upperclassmen and like, it was a whole, it was a whole thing. So they didn't really mind you going. Oh, they were happy to see me go. They, they really were. But like, I believe yeah. West Point has a pretty high attrition rate, right? right? Yeah. Like their goal is to weed people out who don't. Who shouldn't be officers, yeah, right? Yeah, so. but the problem with them is like my PT scores and like a lot of stuff was like, this is, you're like, you should be, you right. should be crushing here. What or, is, what's going on? Like you're, yeah, you're, you're going to, you should be a uh, army commando. Or yeah. Whatever. You should be whatever. You you could be an elite soldier if you if do you it. really wanted, like you actually, if you tried, you'd be really good here. Um, so they were kind of confused at, a, at first, right? And then it just became very apparent that it was like, oh, it's like more of like a moral you know, thing, which is, Hey, and, and they were all actually all, they were good with it. You know, it was, it was funny though. Cause I had to go audition. I was like, you know, I'm going to go audition for a performing arts school. I, I I'm, I'm near New York. And so I went and auditioned for the school, um, the American musical dramatic Academy learned two monologues or whatever, two or three monologues. And, uh, I got in. And so once I got in, that's when I was like, okay, great. I can follow through with leaving West point. Um, and then, yeah, they got, they gave me, an honorable discharge. I left, went home and worked in a box factory for a little bit, uh, which is awful. So, you know, it's funny because these boxes, they, they, I would cut corners in the boxes. So you get a piece of cardboard and I was at a machine and you cut the corners and go. And I was so bad at it. I had to redo things. Uh, it was like, I was so terrible. There's probably so many poorly made boxes out there that like have my fingerprints on it, like that don't fold properly. I, I'm not a really good factory worker. Um, but I did that for a minute and then, yeah, and then went out to, out here, Los Angeles, um, went to school. Oh, the school was out here. Yeah. I auditioned, they, they so you campus, auditioned in they, New York, but the school is here. Yeah. They had a campus in New York and they had a campus out here. And I was like, I'm kind of, I want to leave New York a little bit cause it just of, of the military. I just want to kind of get away and try something new. Um, yeah, I got my BFA in, in acting out here at AMDA and then 
some stuff happened, and then I go and got my MFA, like stuff more. So it was like I performed, I was in stuff, I was in plays and stuff. Um, and then I got my MFA from Cal Arts in acting. Uh, and during Which is, that that's time, another great school. Another great school. Another great school. You know, banger after banger with me, man. I know. Sorry, this is like I'm like I no, feel like I, I'm, I'm droning on about no, myself. No, no, no. I'm, I'm like, just pointing out <laughs> that I'm talking to an elite. <laughs> an elite. I mean, let's. I whatever. I was raised. You know. You know my background. Like, like. Yeah. Education matters. Yeah. And, and going going to quality schools, I think, does reflect well on people. Yeah. And it, I always had this idea of like, you know, I don't know enough or there's nothing wrong with learning more, especially about like, I have, like, I have no ego when it comes to acting or, or owning up to things I don't know as far as filmmaking, all this stuff. I, I really, there's no ego with me when it comes to this kind of stuff. And, and I think that was a thing like why I also wanted to pursue you know, getting an MFA because it's like, you know, like I'm doing well out here. I've got these incredible agents. Things just weren't quite working out. I was like in like, you know, a West coast premiere of a play and stuff. Um, and it just, that didn't work out. Everything was kind of just not working out. It's like, well, you know, why not take the time to like, just get better? Cause there's tons of things I don't know. And, and Cal Arts being such an experimental school, getting you out of like your head and kind of getting more into your body and like, doing weird shit you know it's a, it's the weird school you know um it for for the better like it's it's some people really need that and i needed that um and it really just opened me up even more more so just kind of everything as a as a whole performer and uh i don't want to say entertainer because that's not really what i'm trying to do but you know what i mean right no no yeah. and 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 i imagine they they must have really valued that you were coming from a different place. Yeah. I mean, the number of people, the fact that you were at West Point and almost on track to become a, a lifetime career military yeah. officer. Oh, God. And then yeah. you shift to a, a, a Bachelor's of Fine Arts and a Master's of Fine Arts at a school like Cal Arts, which it's interesting because obviously I, I've i known and met a lot of people who do animation up there yeah. and a lot of art and directing. Of course, it's famous for David Lynch. Yeah, and, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Tim Burton. Uh, Tim Burton, and, yeah. And, I mean, all the best, like, animators. Like, I mean, that Spider into the and actually really guys. great, uh, But, but yeah. really great performers. I actually am aware that, like, there's the great Groundlings who went yeah. there and stuff. Ed Harris went there. Allison yeah. Brie. Um, yeah. There are, like, a lot. There is, like, this, like, great history yeah. of, of so, performers. So there. up there, was it... Uh, is it like super rad to be an acting student there because there's these student films being made by like like yeah. do they do they pluck from the acting program to star in the they, student films and stuff because there's people getting their MFA in filmmaking yeah hundred and it's great film school too right um, I think like uh, I'm trying to think of like um, Sofia Coppola went there for photography. But then um, uh, James Mangold was is a graduate from there, you know, and he just did uh, Indiana Jones film, right? He's he did, done yeah. a ton He's of done great tons films. of movies, right? Yeah, and so it is like there's like it's a it's a really good film program. But it's funny, man, and, and it's like goes like this with a lot of these performing arts schools. Oh. That, yeah, yeah, they don't you don't you don't really they don't intermix. have the programs in Iraq. No, ever. I mean, like, look, Cal Arts is interesting in the fact that they would post. Um, if, you know, someone's casting a short film or a film or whatever they're doing there, they could go to the acting department or kind of hallways, right? There's like, it's kind of this floor. Um, and all the walls would be covered with like um, flyers for a party or for, you know, a short film or for, hey, I need a VO because I'm an animator. So like, in the, it's an interesting way to communicate, but like how Arts is known for the, anyone putting something up on a wall and like, that's how you kind of get people to do things. Um, so they would, the film people would come over and and put some flyers up. But you really have to be like on the lookout. And so we really didn't, I didn't really interact a lot with the film department, um, which is kind of a bummer. But I, I kind of quickly learned because I was there for one year was during COVID where we were kind of all online. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah. So that forced me to, you know, the first year we're in person for most of it and then COVID hits, right? And then that second year, we're all online. It's a three year program for the actors for the MFA program. And um so we're online and we're being asked to film a lot of stuff. And I just kind of was like, well, you know, like I'm now like why not like take some film classes, try to do some film stuff, figure this kind of thing out because it's something that's kind of been in the back of your head where it's like, I've seen people do it and I don't go, I never necessarily was like, Hey man, I can do, do that better. But I'm like, 
I think I can do that. I think I, I, I think I know enough, seen enough. I think I can do it. There's things I don't know, but I can, I can learn, right? You know, I can pick up some things and, and, and really it's all about just communicating what you want. So I got to just understand the language that, you know, these filmmakers, these film students are speaking. Um, and so I kind of, I tried to take some film classes. Things didn't work out because like, again, the film program, film students have priority, and with COVID, short-staffed. So I couldn't really get into any film programs. But what I did do was I got into um, Incredible Writing class by uh, uh, Lou, Lou Clark, Incredible Writer. Um, and then I got into and did a, my own solo class with him where he was my teacher. I would write and we would just meet up and, and do our own thing. And then uh, Peter Flaherty, incredible visual artist, um, installation artist, does a lot of um, incredible visual art. Um, and he, he became another mentor of mine and I would be making short films essentially. Like that wasn't like his, his, that wasn't his focus, but he became this great like resource and we'd meet like once a week, show my work, what I was working on, what I'm trying to do and like give me feedback. And it was so, it was one of these the coolest experiences. You're like kind of, re- you really feel like you're not a student, you're like a peer and like you're, you're getting this great feedback from these like mentors. Um, at least this is my experience at Cal Arts, Right. Um, and it was incredible because they were so helpful, so kind with their time. And, and then when I'm like working with, you know, for, for Lou, for example, um, he's great friends. We're talking about movies and stuff when we're in these, these one-on-ones and I mentioned, you know, Hey, I was a big fan of like this Mark Pellington film, like way back when he's like, I melt with you. You like that film that Mark Pellington made that nobody has seen. And even Mark Pellington would say no one has seen. Um, and I was like, I was like, yeah, I love that film. And he was like, Hey, um, I'm best friends with Mark Pellington. Um, and boom, like I've now, he connected me with Mark and now Mark's been a very, very kind, um, supporter of mine and a good resource. Like it just kind of nuts. Um, when I was thinking some doors were kind of closing at Cal Arts, I just kind of found some other people that would help me kind of pursue this filmmaking thing that I've been kind of clearly interested in ever since I was a little kid, but just wasn't, I don't know, didn't have the courage or the, the kind of, I don't know. There was like something always, I was afraid, I think, just to kind of like put myself out there. Well, also, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to pull this out of my ass, but, yeah, it, please so- do. but it sounds like you, uh, you know, when you grow up in, in, in a small town, Ohio, you're not exposed to the idea of directing filmmaking stuff. So, so yeah. it kind of is natural to go into acting first. Easy. It's easier. And yeah. It seems more accessible, yeah. right? And plus you can hop on any stage. You started with stage, which yeah. I actually think is wonderful when people start <laughs> with stage instead of like wanting to be on camera from, from, from like the their first, for their first, my first acting class, I'd like to get on tape. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like, like, ooh, yikes. Like okay, you, you, you have to think <laughs> twice, but... It sounds like a very natural progression. Yeah. And I'm curious, at, at Cal Arts, when you were doing this independent study kind of thing. Yeah. With, with there we go. That's professors. the right word. I'm like, oh, oh sorry. Yes. <laughs> no, you're like, Adam, it's called an independent study. No, no, we, no. I, I, I was searching I, for it Every earlier. school's yeah. different. My school had an independent study. But, <laughs> but uh, and uh, like, could you also grab equipment? Like, did you have access to equipment there or were you doing it? Or was this recent enough that you could like shoot shit on your phone? Well, yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of what I decided because we could figure out we at the time it normally would have been possible to work out some equipment kind of deal but it was covid and so it made it very difficult and again the film program there i think any other year they would have been open arms to me and been like yes yeah, so let's figure out something that's going to work for you because i was on the waiting list for a lot of classes because i don't want to i don't want to put down the film program they were actually really really kind but it became very difficult um for them, you know, with, with all the making sure, cause they didn't want anyone getting sick and anything like that. And totally understandable. So it forced me to kind of go into using my phone. Big fan of Sean Baker, Tangerine, I think is an incredible film. Shot that on an iPhone SE. Like that doesn't even like, you can't even find an SE. No one would want one. Right. You know? And it's like, that really allowed me. And also at the time, you know, Soderbergh did Unsane. Um, and I think High Flying Bird came out too. two films he shot on iPhones and I was like, wow, you know, I, I got this thing here. It's not, not the camera I want to be using, but it's what I've got. So why should I wait any longer, you know? Um, and that's kind of where Space Junk started coming out of to get into Space Junk. Because at a certain time, right after I graduated, 
I'd written this script. I was working on this kind of script um, with with Lou, my my other mentor at, at CalArts, and um, it was like I want to. A lot of people I see at these like schools and stuff, and this is not not trying to throw shade, but like, people will be in a writing class, they'll write these incredible things, um, and then nothing happens with them. And I approached my time with Lou of being like, whatever I make in here, whatever I write in here, I'm going to make. So i got to come at it from that perspective. What's going to be doable for me to, to accomplish and achieve while still, still being able to explore a visual style um, and the kind of things I'm interested in or possibly interested in exploring as a filmmaker. And so out of, out of that, I, I made that script and it was like, okay, cool. Let's, let's make this thing. And it became very apparent right after I graduated Cal Arts that like my time right before Cal Arts, in between my undergrad and my MFA and the time after, once you graduate, it's like, okay, you're done. There's no, yeah, there's the, no more school. You're not going to be a professional student. Yeah. Yeah. And no one's going to be there. I mean, yeah. Like again, people will help you if you ask for stuff, but like, it's not like you're done. You have to figure out what you're going to do now and, you know, age and stuff, all that stuff. Right. And I was so, what drove me to Cal Arts was I was so tired of waiting around for work. I wasn't getting enough work at the time. I wasn't getting the auditions that I wanted or I thought that, that I at least deserved audition wise. Not saying I deserved the part, but like a, a shot at, right. Um, cause they started to fall off at a certain point. And, and so now I'm like, got my MFA. I've got this passion for making films, but now I'm right back at square one. And what am I going to do? Am I going to sit here, like, again, not to throw some shade, but, like, what other people might do, wait around for a casting director to give me a part or to audition for someone and then, like, make it... Start bartending and tell everyone you should be in pictures? Yeah, right? You know what I mean? It's, like, (laughs) one of those things. Yeah, it's, like, like, why am I waiting around for these opportunities that clearly people don't know what to do with me as a performer? Like, uh, you're, like too old for this or you're too young for this but you're 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 kind of got an older vibe but you're not the right age you know or like you know I've, i had one things for like something like an audition for like the punisher tv show and they came back with uh uh it's too good looking for this thing never got in my life and, and people i know this isn't a visual medium here i'm a okay looking person um <laughs> but like and then i'd get feedback too where it was just like oh hey we loved adam not the right guy decided to go a different direction so it was always always just not the right fit you know always the what's the phrase always the bridesmaid never the bride it was just never that put on a veil for so many shows just never worked out and i was about to fall into that again graduating cal arts and i'm like i'm just kind of done waiting around like i'm gonna make my own opportunities and that's what it's like i was like hey i got my friends involved with space junk i was like hey i'm gonna make this thing like i don't know what i'm doing but I'm going to figure it out. Would you want to be in this? So I didn't hold any auditions for any of the, the, the cast. I wrote for them. And the, everyone that's in the film, they're all Cal Arts people. Um, and yeah, then we made it. I mean, very shortly, I feel like very shortly after and graduation. And you had written it, you had written it with that professor's yeah. guidance. K- yeah, kicking so around this of. idea. But yeah, was, it, yeah. was it fully formed or did you continue rewriting after after yeah. the graduation? I never stopped writing, man, until the day yeah. of yeah, sure. everything. I am always changing stuff just because, you know, I really, I go like, why not? If, if, if there's a possibility of making it better, sometimes people would be like, oh, that might hurt the film if you're always constantly rewriting but i always feel my best the more i am writing the better the thing gets like for me um and so it was was really changing changing constantly uh until it kind of settled on this the thing that it is now you know what i mean like this weird the art house but like not too you know the art house thing is funny because it's like whenever i think of like art house i think it's like you know it's like uh it's a little snobby or a little like, you know, like th- th- there can be that vibe. I'm not saying the people are like that by any means, but there's like some sort of perception that I have. Like, I don't even like calling my stuff films. I call them movies because I feel like that's a little too, you know. Um, but the art house thing, it's funny because I, it, it is, it is an art house film, but with a, I wanted to make sure it was approached with like this sense of humor, this, this melancholy sense of humor. Um, so I'm kind of poking fun at art house while also like adhering to the, the form of what an art house film should be. I mean, like you said, you're making a movie yeah. and you're just telling a story. Yeah. And you told 
Now, by the way, now that I know your life story, or <laughs> yeah, the, the you, Reader's you Digest abbreviated <laughs> life story, it adds a lot to the film, actually, because yeah. I, I, I confess, I am like, I am paying attention, but <laughs> part of my brain is also going, oh, fuck, so you were sort of, I mean, in a way, you were out of place at West Point, you were out yeah. of place, but then you went into acting, and then yeah. you probably were out of place there, as, yep. and your character <laughs> in Space Junk... That person is out of place. Yeah. Like, hugely. Yeah. So, I mean, you were clearly... You're getting it, Jeff. I love, I and I love this it. guy. <laughs> at one point when I was telling my story, I look over at Jeff, and his eyes were closed for about 30 minutes. No, <laughs> he said he wasn't asleep. He said he does this all for all of his interviews, but I suspect... <laughs> I think better with the eyes closed. No, it's funny. I, uh... You were deep in thought. You were, no, his eyes were wide. He was, he was I'm, so I'm, engaged I'm with I'm falling me. into your eyes. I'm just eye contact nonstop, <laughs> and I'm going, who the fuck would say you're not good looking? No, you're too good looking? Fuck that. Yeah, I, it's, in, it's an insane business with all these casting directors. So well, and I Lord knows that. every, yeah, I, we, we don't have to get into casting, but casting, yeah. casting, I have nothing uh, but empathy for actors about casting because yeah. the way it's done, it's rough, man. It's rough. And, and you know, it's not about you. It's just about what they're, how their preconception, how you fit a preconception. Yeah, And they're looking for something too. And they're I, and I, and I don't envy their job. Of, of needing to look at it's like it's like almost running a, a film festival you have to watch all these things and you don't want to say no to someone you don't want you i think you probably turn on every film and you want it to be good why would you want to sit there and watch a bad film you know like i think every casting director and actor that comes in they want you to be the person you know what i mean i i i truly do believe as much as like i have frustrations with with casting directors i don't think there's any casting director that that approaches it i don't know it, it's any other really way. it's Look, acting is fucking hard. Yeah. But every actor I've ever talked to who like made a film and had to cast their film has said something along the lines of, I get it now. Yeah. Like, like you're like, that person's great, but not for this. Or they showed me something I wasn't expecting for this and I'm going to go with it. Yeah. But, but either, but then that means someone who fit the preconception didn't get it. Like, like you realize, you know. Unless you're going to make a hundred different versions of the film, like you have to just, you have to go with someone. Yeah. And it's, it's tough for everybody. It's really hard. Um, I, I want to go back though to what you said though, when with the, with the character being like out, uh, of, place, out of place, yeah. well, it's funny, you know, like my, I have my, my, my Jewish name is, is Gershom. Okay. And Gershom is, is the son. Uh, so is the son of Moses and the name means stranger in a strange land. Isn't it? <laughs> Get out of town. And that's Where? the name they gave you uh, at, at religious school, like when they assign a Hebrew name? Or so, was it your parents' so, name? So, here, no, so here's the fun, the fun thing with this. I actually had to go through uh, conversion um, because I didn't grow up Jewish. You didn't grow up with that. So I had to choose, I chose, I had to choose a name when I went through that, you know, because you go through the Beit Din, you do the whole deal, right? Um, so later in life, you, you went for a. Uh, yeah, well, because you know, you're, it's a weird, it's a weird thing. You're like, I, I want those bar mitzvah presents. I want those presents. I need that bar mitzvah money to go make a movie. <laughs> that would be. So I really need that. You actually just wrote a script. Now you should make a movie about someone, an adult <laughs> who holds a bar mitzvah just to raise funds for a film. There we go. We could. See, uh, you know, Adam Sandler would probably produce it. But it'd be a sequel it, to it, the new bar mitzvah. It'd be the, great you're so for that. You're so not yeah. invited. It'd be you are so invited to my my bar, bit, bar I'm mitzvah. I'm gonna invite everyone yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah, please come. Bring money. Sadly, um, you're just gonna get a bag of peanuts and a water. <laughs> yeah, but it'll be worth it. Trust me. No, but see, that's um, but that's interesting. So yeah, how old were you when you? Uh, oh man, I kind of. It was like maybe I was around twenty five. And so so, so post. Post West Point, but I was going to synagogue at this at West Point a lot. Um, I was going to you know Shabbat dinners all the time because uh, there's like a small Jewish community there. Um, well, West Point's known for it. <laughs> it's, known, it's known for it. There is not it's a just, Jewish yeah. parent in a and you know two two lay Jews. Uh, well, I don't know if you're necessarily a lay Jew, but mm. I am a lay Jew. Sure, sure. But sure, uh, yeah. in fact, I was. I had to tell my wife. Oh, well, I'm saying this while it's being recorded. But this morning, I actually had to inform her, well, the kid doesn't have school Monday. She's like, why? I went, eh, it's, it's Yom Kippur. It's Yom Kippur. Like, yeah, I realize yeah, that we yeah, don't yeah. know in this household when it's coming, but that she's staying home because, of course, LA Unified School District 
too many teachers are Jewish for them to teach on the high holidays That's for Jews. Incredible. So they take a day off and they call it an administrative day. Because if you told all the Christians, we're taking the day off because we have too many Jewish teachers, oh my God. they'd be like, well, what about ours? Some of our, all the, you know, it's just funny. Yeah, that's, that's actually kind of like insane. But that, the work around with that, when it's like, well, we take Christmas time. Administrative all, day, yeah. Like, yeah but, but anyway, but so, no, that's just, so yeah. around the time you were getting the BFA? No, or? so I was done with that, and I so it's like you know, what's when I was going to synagogue, and then when I came back out here, I kind of was that. Fell by the way, that. I'm going to ask a totally yeah, unrelated. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. jump in and interrupt yeah. again and say, so what was it? Kind of like was it a nice relief to like get into that little little community at West Point? And yeah, like feel part of that community, even though you didn't because you were out of place. Yeah. In there in general. There, like, yeah, as well. Heck, yeah. You might even got a little more backup on the pacifist vibe. Yeah. No, I mean, no, you're 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 kind of hitting on it because it is like this. Um so the funny thing is it was like I was kind of next door roommates. I I kind of I'm almost forgetting how this worked, or he was either in my squad for boot camp, I forget. Uh, it was the rabbi's son. There's just like a the there's a rabbinical there's like a rabbi, um, yeah, like the rabbi chap. Yeah, 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 the chap. There we go. Yeah, the rabbi like chaplain, the equivalent of that, right, or whatever. Um, and it was his son that was there, and he was like, "Hey, yeah, do you want to come to you know services and this and that?" And I was like, "You know, I'm not like a r- religious person really at all." Um, but then I was like, "Oh, I realized I'm like, okay, great, wow." He was like, "You know, if you go to services, you don't have to go do this other training and stuff." And I was like. Sign me up. I'm in. So I would go mostly to get out of out of certain things I didn't want to do, but it was really really fun. I had like a, it was it felt really, it felt right. It felt nice. Um, so welcoming, so inviting, and it felt it was like probably something I needed at the time. Being a little feeling out of place, even though I was still out of place. Like my Hebrew is still not very good, right? I mean, but it. Yeah, it was kind of like finding a place that I felt a little bit less out of place, right? Um, and then when I left West Point and was out here, you know, I kind of, again, didn't didn't go to synagogue or really have, like, a community again either. Because, again, I'm another, I'm a stranger again in another strange land. I keep on kind of putting myself in these, like, environments where it's, like, kind of works, but it also kind of isn't working. Um, or, like, we don't know what to do with you kind of thing. And it wasn't until, you know, I was, like, dating... Um, a lot of Jewish women at the time. And then like one person I was dating at the time, their father was a rabbi or like was, was like a rabbi at a time, wasn't anymore. Um, and so it's kind of constantly around, you know, um, people that maybe were at a time more religious Jews. Um, so it was always kind of around, right? So it was always, once I was like, you know, dating uh, a lot more, it was always kind of a thing that was going on. And then when I met uh, my, my wife now, Rachel, um, she, you know, she wasn't born and raised in Israel, but she lived in Israel for a while. Um, her dad still lives in Israel. He's from Morocco. Um, and when we were together, her mom is from Philadelphia. But so when we were kind of getting together, it was like, oh, you know, like, wow, they, they grew up religious, um, you know, Orthodox Jews. Um, not anymore. Uh, dad, you know, uh, my father-in-law is, is still pretty religious, though. Um, but we were kind of, I was kind of, they, they, they really were up on the, the, the holidays and the holy days and stuff. And like, it was kind of, it was really, really nice. I was like, you know what? Like, I think I should just kind of go through with this, like make this official, um, and make this kind of like an official conversion thing, which sounds like intense. It's really not. You just kind of go and like, that's a couple classes. It's a couple classes. Yeah. yeah and you like, it's painfully easy. But yeah. Everyone thinks it's like tough. Yeah. It's not. And it's like everyone that's there is like, everyone there is Jewish. And it's like, either it's like, oh, you know, I'm here to catch up on this stuff. Or like, I kind of, my parents weren't religious. So I just kind of want to know what's going on. Or I never had a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah. So like, I want to be here to take these classes. You know, like right. it's so, it's so, so you funny. had an identity growing up, but no practicing. Yeah. Didn't there's no, with the, well, my, my parents are like hardcore, not hardcore, but they're like, they're Catholic. That's, oh, Catholic. That's, that's their deal. Oh, got you. Yeah, man. Got you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so French Catholic Canadian. Got yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's really, that's really the thing. And I, cause I, I never like get into all this stuff. Cause now it's like, once you're converted, you do the whole thing. It's like, you're Jewish. That's what you are. That's your deal. My, my whole family now, you know, on one side is Jewish uh, as, as they can be, you know what I mean? Um, and so it's really funny that like it, and, and so, and how I got into it at West Point too, is the rabbi's son thought I was Jewish. Oh, <laughs> well, he looked at you. Yeah. 
He went. Uh, yeah. I, I was, guess you know what I could see it. I guess I could. See I it. guess I don't know. I, you know, I don't really go. You know, like they immediately. We live in a tough world because right? we're not supposed know, to judge know. people by their. I know. Phenotype anymore. Watch yourself. <laughs> you shouldn't look at them, but everyone looks at everyone looks at each other. Yeah. Goes, Where are you from? Where's your family? Yeah. What's your family history? Everyone, everyone just. It, it was just funny when I was West Point. Everyone thought I was Jewish everywhere I went. Everyone thought I was Jewish at the you know, and it just became this like thing. Um, and I was like, yeah, why not? And it, it was it was great. Still love it. I love being Jewish now. Um, it's it's awesome. Parents are big big fans of it. They were all about it. They're like, yeah, that's great. Go for it. That's what you want to do. Excellent. And and my wife and her family, they didn't push me into converting or anything as as well. It was like you don't need to do that. I don't know if you want to. Um, but it's another great experience. Again, there's this constant theme of like me and my life now that I'm talking to you about this, it's like being like a stranger in a strange land, being in like a weird circumstance that maybe I don't quite fit in. Um, but I'm always wanting to like learn very curious. That's hence like school still going yeah. to West Point, even though I know I want to do theater and like, honestly, it's a great, it's a great thing that you, you end up, you're the stranger in a strange land. And then you find your, you find your place in that. Yeah. Like, you find your place in that land. I like, carve it out a little like, bit. Yeah. Like if there was only another Hebrew word for like the stranger who found his place. Yeah. Yeah. Among right. Strangers. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. Like, yeah. Cause it, it is, it's, it's beautiful. Cause instead of quitting or getting angry or moving away, you know, you made the best and yeah, you know, I know it's hard to date in LA without dating <laughs> Jewish girls anyway. Cause <laughs> I don't know. It's it's. I apologize to anyone listening to this who like yeah. thinks like you know the world is. How come you know point one percent of the world gets talked about so much? I can't figure it out. I know. But yeah. LA is like twenty percent Jewish or something. It's kind of it's it's a lot. It's insane, especially in the acting world or, or theater world. Yeah, entertainment I mean, in general. Uh, yeah. If it weren't for Jews, gays, and gay Jews, there'd be no live theater. <laughs> and we would be worse off for that. I think. Yeah. No. It's <laughs> come it's, on. You know. I mean, it's, it's, it's an old joke, but it's true. Yeah. It's, it's like, you know, why are all the plays about these topics? Cause that's who's writing them. And that's who's paying to go. Yeah. It's a good, uh, it's a, it's been a great contribution, um, to society that Jews have given, given us in entertainment. I, I think there's, there's <laughs> arguments. Yeah. I, right. Yeah, I won't, I won't. You know, needless to say, like needless trouble now, to say the, the deep down, I could not hide my pride watching Oppenheimer <laughs> and all these great <laughs> physicists from all over Europe, all these guys with their accents and some from New York. And sure. Like Oppenheimer himself was born here. Yeah. But like, just like I was like, fucking hell, how how did this little community manage to produce this many geniuses? Like, I it know. is kind of trippy. They got in where they could fit in, man. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, like, because we were actually, yeah. I do know the historical reason. <laughs> yeah, banned yeah, right. from the guilds, banned from the yeah. trades. Banned from everything, so had to go into banking and science. Yeah, that was it. I mean, yeah, they got had to in do these new in. fields because otherwise, because no one else if you wanted to, to be it. a yeah, if you wanted to make do, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take on a Jewish apprentice in my yeah. leather shop. Fuck you, you you heathen. No, hundred percent. And like, I think like back in the day too, like in Roman times or whatever, like the tax collectors. I mean, no one wanted that job because everyone hated the tax collectors. So they're like, great, we hate Jews. You guys are gonna do that job. I mean, like that's kind of like. Being outsiders yeah. was had its downsides. A hundred percent. But I mean, there's a very good. I actually saw the famous stand-up comedian Alan King. Okay, he and uh, who was the other guy debated okay. at, like King, Cambridge yeah. debated two British comedians on what's better, American comedy or British comedy. Oh, interesting. And he made the point of like British comedy is the comedy of the upper class, and American comedy is comedy of the outsider. It's African that. Americans. It's Jews. It's it's the fringe f- putting up their fist to power with comedy. That's kind of great because it's always yeah. With us here in America, they're just like punching up it's more punching so. Up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and British comedy often is. So, I mean, sometimes they'll make fun of the upper class. Sure, but there's a lot of punching down in those cultures. Oh, that's so interesting. That's kind of a very. Uh... Very, 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 very smart observation. Yeah, that's Alan made. King, you know, oh, who yeah, actually yeah. I never found funny, but obviously a bright guy. <laughs> <laughs> he got some right. I don't know. He did do that right. <laughs> but yeah, so so I, I get it. So yeah. Okay, so how do we get back onto your, yeah, onto your story? Yeah, I'm so, derailing so, this, man. So, I'm talking so much. So dating and, and, and you got interested in that. And, yeah. And, you know, obviously, uh, I don't know. So so <laughs> you were focusing on acting and all that. Yeah, and yeah. You, and you just, and you. 
did this conversion. Back. Yeah. And then so I converted before I went to um, Cal Arts. Right. So um, in between BFA and MFA. Yeah. Yeah. I had, I had some, once, once the acting auditions are drying up, I had some free time. So that's where I kind of was like auditioning for grad schools, doing the conversion thing, got married. Um, and then, yeah. So I went, so then I went to Cal Arts, you know, as a converted Jew who was married. And then left there as a converted Jew who's married, who now wants to make movies. <laughs> make movies, right, right, right. Because yeah. you went in for acting and you came yeah. out, you came out yeah. already writing. And, and, and like you said, you said something yeah. huge, which was from the get-go, if I was writing it, I wanted to make it. Yeah. Which, which is a big difference than someone who wants to have a stack of scripts in, in a drawer for that one day when they get a meeting and, they, and the person says, what do you got? And you can say, I got 10. Right, it's... I, well, I, I, cause I just kind of knew again, like what it seemed like was happening for me. It's like, I was tired of just waiting around and I just knew that just seems like another waiting game, right? 10 scripts. Let's wait till someone wants to do one of them. Right. It's like, I can act. We know I can act sort of, right. You know what I mean? I kind of know this now. Um, I can kind of write Then let's just like, why don't I just do all the, why don't I just play all the parts on the, in regards to like behind the, behind the camera and then I'll act in front of it because then I don't have to worry about scheduling an actor that's got to be there for every single shoot day. You know what I mean? It kind of just came out of necessity. Why? And like scheduling why I made myself the lead and all, all the stuff I do. But did you consider not playing the lead? Um, the, you know, there at one point, because people kept on saying like, Hey, it's really hard for your first time doing anything to write, direct and act in it. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. But I'm like, military is hard. And I did that. And I left on my own terms. Like, you know, uh, there's been so many things. Working at a box factory was hard. But like, I did, you know what I mean? It's like, all right. Like, I, I'm, I'm tired of like, it, it, the people that close to me that I admired weren't saying that. But like other people that were smart, kind, just trying to look out for me because they like, they wanted me to succeed. were just like, you, you know, probably shouldn't do all this stuff. I'm like, well, I'm going to fucking do all this stuff. Like, why not? I'm just like, I'm going to learn. And like, look, the worst thing that's going to happen, no one's going to want to watch this movie. Yeah, which is a pretty low bar. That's that's not that bad. Yeah, low stakes, honestly. Like, I know. Send it out to 20 film festivals. Yeah. If you had gotten 20 no's, what harm was it actually? Yeah. It's like, okay, cool. It's not like you're in line at at the supermarket and people are like, oh, that's the guy who's, who's filmed in didn't go anywhere like yeah. fuck it that's 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 no problem there are no i i have nothing to lose with any any with this movie the the other one that i made too there's nothing to lose like i've got so it's like why not why not go for it and see what happens and i think like space junk was like a big swing for someone who knew nothing about making movies right and then like, i gotta say i don't think on their well, own. did we cover that at your q a at the theater last year like did you know. say this is my first film I think I don't, I don't know if I did. I know it was just we were talking about the iPhone aspect of it. I I believe that was mentioned. I know maybe, but, um, but I was. I mean, honestly, I didn't know you were that green. Cause, yeah, because no it, it's it certainly looks it. It's got the vibe of like this is his seventh or something. Going yeah. short, you know what I mean. And he just decided to shoot on an iPhone as some sort of yeah, choice also, or experiment you know, but, or whatever. But, yeah, but the the sophistication of the choices are. Well, I appreciate impressive. That. Like, like it, it looks, it doesn't, it doesn't look and feel like, ah, you know, I, I took a stab at it. Like, like it it's amateur like hour. It was from yeah. Some, yeah. Yeah. No. I know. I appreciate that because I mean, again, I, a lot of that, uh, you know, all that stuff, I put a lot of, I watch so much, so many things. Right. You know, and I'm like, I, I'm, I think I was, I'm very lucky. I was able to hang on to a lot of things, things that I liked. And it's like, you know, you're stealing from a lot of people certain things and like vibes, this and that certain shot styles and st- stuff like that. And it filtered through me. It kind of came out into this thing. And I kind of knew, like, I didn't know if it was all going to work, but it was like one of those things where I'm like, I'm just going to do this. I think I, I, I know, I do know what I want. And because there's no, I'm not being indecisive on that. I think that's why it kind of comes out as, I guess, a relatively confident film you know what i mean movie i shouldn't say film i say movie i'm gonna keep it on brand with myself here but like i think i think i think you kind of you see that there right um and i think that kind of translates over to you know my other my other short that i done as well another big swing because i also constantly want to keep myself interested in challenging myself um and i think again like with Space Junk, it's like, didn't know anything at all. And it turned out, all right, you know? Um, 
and with men grieving, uh, this, the other short film, it's another big, big swing. It's a one and it's like a whole deal, you know, and it's, it, it's fun. I think for me, the challenges are exciting, you know, and, um, yeah, that's what keeps it kind of engaging for me, I guess, now as, as a filmmaker, like really pushing myself. Yeah. And the one, and now that I know your, now that I know your story, <laughs> I know. the one <laughs> I mean, did all your stage experience? Cause, cause like came into play. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, it is, I mean, obviously a, a one shot film yeah. and it's, and it's not short, right? It's about, it's like 12 minutes, 12 minutes, and 13 12, because of I mean, the that's, credits, that's, <laughs> yes. but, but 12, <laughs> I mean, forget the logistics of it. Yeah. It's it's a stage performance, right? For sure, with, with cameras. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. With, with the audience as the camera, but but you and and your fellow actor, yeah, Lucas, yeah, yeah, uh, are 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 performing on stage, really, because there's no breaks, there's no cuts, there's no nothing. Yeah, it, and it was one of those things that kind of just turned in to that because in, initially it wasn't like I was like, oh, cool, we got to I want I really want to do a one or, but it was this thing of like I, I I'm constantly trying to like. I'm interested in putting the audience in the circumstance of the characters, right? And my characters are always in at least the the, the main character is always in a very uncomfortable situation, almost unreal. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, right. With how like awkward and like the weird position that he's he's being. Well, we not we're not right. Being, like, yeah. like you let you le- you let the audience wonder. Yes, right. You yeah. don't spoon feed the audience. Right, exactly what's happening in either film. Yeah, a hundred percent. Right, because I like to drop people in. I like I like to disarm an audience. Right, and I felt like you know with this, I'm like, wow, what would be so? What would make this already uncomfortable topic and men grieving more uncomfortable is if it's like happening in real time and the audience is stuck with these two two grieving men who are you know, incapable of dealing with their emotions. And I felt like a one would, would give uh, the right energy. Um, Cause a lot of people that watch it, uh, you know, some people, it, 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 it's a interesting film because some people like either really hate it because it's so kind of in your face with the lens that we're using and the one and the vibe and the very dry, dark comedy. Well, and it's um, intentionally claustrophobic, right? Yes. A hundred percent. We would, so we're using like a very wide, wide lens. I mean, this is an anamorphic lens that is, um, it's almost giving you like a whole like 180 view of this room. And it's, it's supposed to be for, outside or some incredible lens flare lens flares in like a really nice big spacious room or some sort of um you know incredible setting outside where you can see you know mountains or something like that right or a big house or something and no we're using this incredible lens that's meant for that but in the smallest waiting room possible you know and like again we i wanted it to feel like no matter where these guys are at you're going to be able to see them on camera they can't escape they can't escape the audience and the audience can't escape these guys um, as a, to, to kind of enhance the uncomfortability there. Um, and I never would have done, you know, men grieving like that if I hadn't done something like space junk, where it was like, that was a challenge. And cause I just didn't know a lot. I learned a little <laughs> and try to apply what I learned to men grieving while also wanting to still be in a position to where I'm like, I don't know everything. I don't want to do something that's safe as far as like, the next, what's the next logical movie to make, right? The next logical movie to make would have been a even better movie on my iPhone. You know what I mean? Right. To some degree. Right. You know? Um, but this is like, why not push our, myself even further and see what I can learn? Um, and everyone's always usually on board because I think, I guess it's probably not coming through on this. I probably sound really boring, but I get very excited about my, uh, projects. So I sure as fuck <laughs> hope you don't sound boring. I think that the opposite is true. Okay, good, good. I don't know. Uh, it's if, the most if, I've ever talked if about. Some, if someone's, if, well, I'm glad, but, uh, you know, at the end of this, when I have you, there's some, whatever people, people don't give feedback, but, yeah. but no one listening to this has ever heard uh, someone talk about, uh, Almost ending up in the military and then getting two degrees in acting yeah. and immediately jumping into filmmaking. It doesn't make it's, sense. It's, it's like not, sticking. No, no, it makes perfect sense, sense. But I'm just saying, like, it's not a boring tale. <laughs> good. Okay, good, good. I mean, it's not like, oh, another story. <laughs> another, uh, another, another person. Heard who, this one. Yeah. No, that's good. And, cause I hope it's encouraging. Like, I had no, this wasn't like the plan. You know what I mean? I mean, there really was no plan. Um, and it's just funny to end up here, like, 
with Space Junk being received. Like, I, I, I had no idea people were going to enjoy the movie. I knew it made me laugh, and it made me, it was something like I would want to watch. Um, but I wasn't sure if like, other people were going to be into it. Um, and then Men Grieving, too. I, like, I, I was really hoping, you know, that it would, it got into all the festivals. Um, a lot of the ones I really was aiming for. I'm like, this is actually going to be a, a, a challenge to get into some of these, I think. Right. Um, and it has. And I'm, and it's very, very exciting to see where I'm like, I feel like I'm doing a great job of setting the bar high enough, but it's still achievable. Right. Where there's been some disappointments, some disappointments with space junk, some disappointments with men grieving. But like at the end of the day, like, I mean, come on, you're going to get disappointed with some of these things. Right. Like you make a thing. It's not exactly the thing you wanted. And it's kind of all like, I don't know. It's like it, there's this weird thing where I think of like when people. Like when, with these movies, like I, I kind of go into these things now where I'm like, I know I'm going to be disappointed with some things, but it's like, whatever, control what you can control and, and everything else is like, it is what it is. And it's like with life too, where it's like people like do the whole thing where they're like, hey, live, live life with like no regrets, all that stuff. That's fucking stupid. I have so many regrets. Like, cause that shows that I'm like living a life. There's things that I regret, but that's, that's cool. And they're my I, regrets and that's fine. I am off in the 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 monarch of regrets i got regrets coming out my ass yeah but but that's that comes with having goals yes. right it means you're living yeah. you're living yeah. and you're, if, yeah if, if if my goal yeah if your goal was like i just want you know i just want to get by no no you know it's like, what I don't is want, that i don't want to you know run a film festival or anything i just want to like a job where i get a Talk. steady job where i could just like it i know believe me sometimes i'm jealous of, I, sometimes i sometimes oh i gosh. regret not yes. being the person who just Got the degree in accounting and, and works nine to five. I completely agree. I see this like on like people I, I went to high school with and I'm not in touch with anymore, but I see like they all bought a house. They had like a, a big family and stuff. It's like, man, like there is some appeal there, but it's also like, man, I don't want that. You know, at the end of the day, I really don't want that. I want, I, because I, I wouldn't be able to do this thing, right? You know, or, or whatever it is. And it's like, yeah, the same thing with like starting a, a film festival. That's crazy. No one out there was like, hey, Jeff, will you please start a film festival? You know what I mean? It was like it all had to be generated from you. You took a risk. You took – it's a gamble. You put yourself out there. And I think that's what – like if you're not taking risks um, and you're not – you don't have regrets, it's like that's not a filmmaker that I'm interested in at all, right? You know what I mean? Like if you're batting a 1,000 – then you're really not swinging. You know what I mean? I, I don't, yeah, I don't no, even like I'm baseball. I don't like baseball at all making a baseball reference, but you know what I mean? It's yeah, like, I love going to a baseball game, but I, I don't <laughs> enjoy this sport that much, yeah, it's but it's a, a fun sport. experience. Yeah. But also I was going to say that, that like they're on occasion, there's that person who hits it out of the park baseball. Analogy, sure. Yeah. On their first film and like tons of awards and blah, blah, blah. And it goes somewhere. And then like the follow up, the next two to three are like I, crap. Like, I mean, you don't want to start with your, you don't want to be, Perfect. Orson Welles is like the best example of that. Never could live up to, you know, um, yeah. um, what, what, uh, or yeah, right, Citizen Kane, right? Citizen you know, Kane, yeah, yeah, like that. After that, it was like, you know, he's got some bangers though, but like there's, totally underappreciated. There's film, there's film professors who talk about how much better the films that came after that are. Are, yeah. But they, they didn't have the impact. Yeah. 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 And it's just like, mm. So I'm, I'm pointing yeah. at you so I Good can please. ask you a question. Because you're like, I about want you to leave the two Adam. Films. <laughs> Here's the two. No, I'm. I. I this has been five I, hours. I, I want to ask about a connection between the two films, okay. besides besides all the other connections yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that is you, which is uh, the theme of loss mm -hmm. and death. Yeah, because that's in both. Yeah, 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 yeah. And is does that come from? Do you? Because I mean, I listen to your story and I'm like, mm. shit, man, you were almost surrounded by death yeah. in the Middle East. Yeah, and then you dodge that, but you still seem to be like there's an awareness of it. Yeah, there's an awareness of the fragility of life in a way in in both films. No, you're you're definitely hitting on that. It's definitely something I'm I'm fascinated with, and and I've been around. You know, it's it's like to think like have I had any like you know experienced intense grief, and I and I kind of go or or loss, and you know I it's kind of tough because I don't I can't. So I guess like when I was younger, and this is, you know, the thing, this isn't like the thing that has impacted me by, by any means, but I think me being near, um, and experiencing 
people experiencing intense grief has left an impact on me. Because I remember, at a, you know, a young age, my grandmother died. And look, she lived a great life. Grandmothers, at a certain point, that's what grandparents do. You know what I mean? Like, so it's No, not we a, expect to bury yeah, them, yeah. Yeah, it's not a huge, not to diminish it, not a huge tragedy. It's not a shocker. You know what I mean? Um, but, you know, at that time, this was, there was like an, I remember it was an open casket. And it was so weird to see my, my grandmother. I was like, I was like five years old. Weird. I started to laugh. That was my first, ra- like I started laughing and whatever. And so, but then, and then I remember, and my, my mom was like, don't laugh. Whatever. And, and then I remember going back and I remember seeing like my dad and all these guys. Cause like you kind of grow up, my dad wasn't like this by any means, but I was in the environment of, you know, playing football and stuff where it's like, you know, boys don't cry kind of the deal. And I remember seeing like all these, my dad has 10 brothers and sisters I remember seeing, so five brothers, him included, and seeing like all these, like, as they should, their mothers is gone, right? Crying and weeping. And it was really interesting, counter to, like, the next day going to football practice and, like, crying is not a thing that's, like, uh, allowed, right? You know, it's in small town in Ohio. No, no, it is. Right? It is. Uh, it's an interesting thing. Yeah. yeah. My, my, our kid, she's my stepdaughter. Yeah. And, and at her grandmother's funeral, she's like, why is my dad crying? Yeah. Because she was a little young for it. And I was like, his fucking mom died. That's, I, I literally cursed her out. No, I'm just kidding. I, I did not curse at the, the little kid. No, but it's like, but I was yeah. like, wouldn't you cry if your mom died? Yeah. Like, like, but, but people look at men. It's different. Isn't that, isn't that heartbreaking? Even today with all we've tried to do yeah. of getting rid of these pressures that, you know, a seven-year-old kid is like, why is that man, why is a grown man crying? Like, yeah. grown men don't cry. That's- it's, it's like a cause for concern when we see, like, a, a, a grown man do that to some degree. I know and it. It's, 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 it's just so strange, and I've been around this. And then, like, when my grandfather died, I remember, like, and, and I have so much regret about this. Like, I was doing a play at the time, and I was so pissed off that he died. Uh, and I had to go home to the funeral. And then go back and do the show. And that, you know, there's a, it was a whole deal. And I remember being like, and, and now I'm like, God, you're such an asshole for doing that. And like, I really miss my grandfather. I wish I would have. He was always like, um, you know, wanting to connect with me. And he was so, always so interested, was so happy when I left the military. He was like one of the only people that was very happy when I left West Point. Um, and, and it was so, it's just like, so being around that and then seeing how that affected my mom and my dad and stuff. And then like my mom has a different relationship with her family and it's, it's, it's so weird this I, I i'm going on this tangent though because you're hitting on something because i haven't really experienced me personally a big loss like i've said but i've been around and i feel like i become even more observant when someone is grieving and when someone's grieving in america it's like this thing of like go do that on your own time i don't want to see you like do that in private please right if you're gonna weep and you're a grown man or anyone Go away and do that, please. Like, you know, there, there seems to be a general um, thought on that, right? And it, and so, like, again, with my grandfather dying, it was this, like, oh, okay, well, I've seen these, these men grieve again. But then how they were, like, trying to hold back their emotion. It, it, it was so fascinating to me. And then my attitude towards it was so fascinating now when I look back on it. It's like, what are we talking about here? But then my mom has a different relationship with her, with her family and... Not to get this is this happened right before I started working on men grieving. Um, her, she's a little estranged from her family, um, and her um, her brother uh, killed himself. And I saw how that affected. She couldn't tell me the news. My dad told me, and hearing him uh, process this was so so heartbreaking. And then and then hearing my mom when she could finally talk to me about it. Um, and then talking about her, her experience at the funeral and stuff, you know, I guess I become very receptive to the people's emotions. Not that I'm, I have some sort of gift or anything, but I, for some reason, I you're empathic. Yeah, I kind of start yeah. to pick up on these things, and and all these things happen around me all the time. And maybe this is bad. This is a bad thing. Um, I remember being at the gym before I started doing men grieving as well, and there's this guy on a, on a bike doing his thing and I'm, I'm working out and I just happen to overhear this conversation this other older guy goes up he goes like hey Jim whatever I haven't seen you in a uh, what have you been up to um, he goes well my wife just died yesterday and the guy goes oh that's too bad he said well 
I guess it's good that you're here doing something. He goes, yeah, there's nothing else to do. And he goes off and starts lifting weights. And I was like, whoa, this is wild. And then like being now in like this, like seeing these two older men do this interaction, like that's, that's a crazy, and that is an insane interaction to have, right? At a gym and they just go, they just go on their own way. And then again, then being, going to synagogue a lot too, um, there's, there's always this, uh, uh, unlike in, in most of, I think like American society of like grieve on your own, there's more of like grieve with the community kind of vibe. It's, um, uh, it's, required, it's required by tradition. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this one person, you know, they came up and spoke and it was fascinating to me and uh, I kind of never forgot it where he kind of articulated where when I would see people grieve, this is kind of something he said, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of. Um, it's not a direct quote here, um, but he's like, you know, what? I'd see people grieve before I would would kind of keep them at a arm's distance. Like I kind of I don't want that on me. Right. And then he and then he, he lost his son. And when he said it, and after I lost my son, um, all I wanted to do was be around those people. Right. You know, like and, and it's just so fast. This this dynamic of grief. Um, and I think also, yeah, sure, I'm biased, me being a guy and how like the men kind of um, process emotions um, is really fascinating to me. And so I don't think that's ever going to leave my work uh, at all. The next thing I'm working on is something within that same vein, a, a character kind of dealing with something like that. Um, because I do think, too, with this, with this grief, with tragedy, um, and when you have a character that is awful at handling that or kind of where we are finding them in the story, um, incapable of processing, uh, this kind of grief or not able to articulate their feelings or emotions, right. It's ripe for good comedy as well. Right. And, and it's ripe for a good character arc for a journey for a character to go on to possibly, you know, discover something about themselves or discover something about, um, you know, maybe the person that they, they lost. Right. Um, and I think both, uh, the Asher character and, and Space Junk and, um, um, uh, gosh, Harrison and Percy and Men Grieving kind of go on this journey. One's a little bit more tragic uh, than the other, um, but it is. I I am always constantly fascinated by these characters that are have such a hard time processing their feelings because for some reason they they are ill equipped to deal with their emotions and those feelings are not being able to deal with them. Um, makes them do maybe crazy things or have crazy behavior, um, which can then be received comedically. I think a great touchstone for me is like Punch Drunk Love, Adam Sandler's character in that. Um, very much a character that's that's in this not able to process. Um, um, he's out feelings. of place in his own family. <laughs> yeah, he's out of place like in his own body. How he's yeah. like, like honestly, like how he's feeling. Like, but yeah, like, and so I, I love those kind of characters. Um, and I, again, being someone that's been out of place, but maybe hasn't directly experienced the great. Not not to compare griefs. One grief isn't, wor- but like more so being present for people. Um, experiencing these are just the instances that are popping up in my head at the moment but um yeah sorry so that's a long no, tangent no, but i'm glad a, he brought that a, up it's a great tangent yeah and and i'll add i'm just gonna <laughs> i'm just gonna put a cherry on top of the pie and and i mean is the human condition yeah we were cursed with a frontal lobe uh we're like kind of the only living thing that is aware it's impermanent and will die like that yeah. little, adorable little bunny rabbit. I don't think he's sitting there going, well, I better enjoy the next four years. Yeah. Cause, uh, I better eat all the hay pellets I can and have some fun zoomies around the table because you know, life isn't forever. Like, no, we're, we're like stuck with this weird thing. We're like, we are aware of, of the human condition is it doesn't last forever. Yeah. And I believe the central tenet, I was told, so <laughs> that the central tenet of Buddhism is, is you, there's two things you know in life, which mm. is number one is you're not going to live forever. And number two is what are you going to do now that you know number one? <laughs> that's great. You know? Yeah, that's great. And, and, and so that's why like great art is about death and surviving being a survivor of of losing someone because it's you know i have had actually 
massive loss now. Yeah. Um, of of a of a peer of a mm. lifelong friend lost him to COVID actually, mm. and and it was Sorry like about that. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And and by the way, I'll share that one. Of, I learned I can't shut the fuck up about it even three years later. Like like I just how are you not going to mention that? Yeah, actually, yeah. it's it'll happen. Like value your friends because you know. He was supposed to be around for another 40 years. Yeah. I was supposed to be, you know, I was, you know, we were friends from age 13 to 52. That fucking sucks. And man. then, and then all of a sudden he, he, well, his wife calls me and says he's gone. And it's like, oh, man. well, what do I do now? And the answer is like, every time something happens, I'm reminded I can't call him. Yeah. You know? It's weird. Yeah. So, yeah. So, it's a, so it, thank you for making... And maybe, maybe the Sherman Oaks Film Festival <laughs> in Film Invasion Los Angeles, I don't put my finger on the scale for films no, yeah, much, yeah. but there is a joke around the uh, around the selection committee that, like, you know, if you make Jeff cry, odds are it's going to be... <laughs> he's going to fight for it. But but they're always good films, anyway. If a film yeah. that can make you cry like that, because, yeah... Because we need help doing it because we're told not to. Yeah, yeah. And I think it is important to explore that, too, because it's like all these, you know, not to bring up your friend, but like you, you probably have so many emotions on, oh, on the daily that are like, you know, and some days we're, we're it's not, it's less than other. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's so weird. It's fucking weird. No, and man. it doesn't go away. That's, yeah, that's the interesting it's part. Is weird. I, I think I learned a year. I told, yeah. I think I told his wife now. I won't call him her, his widow but mm. his wife like i you know every once in a while we talk and yeah. we just talk about how much we miss him so I, I realized turns out it's not that it gets better with time no. it's just a you kind of accept but no like actually we were part of a trio and our third friend who is my closest friend in the world is uh his older sister just passed oh, and i man. turn to my fucking wife and go you know i can't call i can't call david the only other person yeah. who knew Sujay's older sister as well as as me. Oh God! And I can't call him and go, "Oh my God, can you believe she's gone?" Yeah, like I got to talk to my wife who never met her. Yeah, it's fucking like it's crazy. It's weird. It's and so of course weird. my friend doesn't want to talk about it. He's like he's he's Hindu and doesn't want to talk about this loss at all. I'm like, <sighs> you need to talk. He's like, I'll call you if I need to. So he's, the phone's not gonna ring. Yeah, but see, it's like it's so nuts. Like even. Uh, what you have to deal with, what everyone else has to deal with, or how everyone processes this stuff, it's it's like so fascinating to me. Um, and again, even this, like me seeing you explain all this, like what you were just describing is okay, kind of hilarious, but awful at the same time. You know what I mean? I mean, it's 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 both these things, and I love. Again, those are my favorite kind of movies where it's like you're not sure if you should laugh or you should cry, or like if these characters knew you were laughing at what was going on, like how would they feel? Like. Again, not to make uh, minimize anything here, but like just even you explain this story, you were so animated with like I want to talk to this guy, but I can't talk to this, and it's like fuck, like why'd you fucking die? Because no, I wish I could I, talk to you, and you're, and then it's like, but then fuck, why'd you have to die? Because like, I mean, it's, I I probably shouldn't have used real names, but the no. wonderful <laughs> thing was I told my friend's wife that I would call Sue Jay and tell him, yeah, and I called him and I told him David's dead, and his first words were that fucker. <laughs> Because we were all funny together. Yeah, we were the funny yeah. guys in high school yeah. and, and junior high. And it was like, but it was like, fuck him. Yeah. How do you fucking do this to us? You know, like we would have want, everyone wants yes. to be the first to go. Basically. Right. So you know, everyone else has to grieve for them. Yeah. And fuck him. He, he won this race. Dude. Like, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. No, like, but dude, that, that's what's so like it. Cause that's so real that like feeling and it's it's so interesting to me, and that's why like when you're like there's no there's nothing that can like it, the grief stays with you right no matter what, and that's why like not to go into men grieving, but that's why there's these two guys that are in office. There's a in this in this world I've created, there's a pot there's an experimental drug that might take the gr your grief away forever, and yeah. these guys are w more willing to <laughs> fill out mountains of paperwork than to maybe actually talk to each other and and deal they, and, and deal with and, it. And uh, and they don't know if they're getting the placebo or the yeah. drug. Yeah, yeah, I know it's yeah, uh, and it's so like it is this thing where grief. It, it's like it wait. It, it's just it's something that just gets added on. Like you know, the more you lose, that stuff's never going to go away. So you're just actually going to be experiencing more and more. Gr There's no way to avoid grief unless you live in a bubble. But then you'd have to be grieving the life that you're not living. So it's like it's just this stuff that's going to be added on to you. These 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 tragic. Uh, losses that are going to happen 
and how you deal with them. I mean, again, your friend's response of, of humor right away, that fucker, that is like, that's brilliant. And it's so true. I mean, like, as funny as that is, it's also heartbreaking. It's it's all the things, right? You know, and it's just like, I and mean, thank you for sharing all this uh, it, stuff. It is, it, is, like, it is the human condition. Yeah. It, is, it is, that is life, you know, and, yeah. it, and it is, uh, yeah. Fuck. It, it's, it's why, uh, you know. I, I was going to bother saying like it's why we have kids and shit so that honestly, the only reason I like social media is, well, besides the pets. <laughs> yes. The pet, the pet, I, the I do pet, love pet the videos. Pets. The pets the, are yes, nice. Yeah, uh, the I love the Husky videos because mm. they're freaking amazing and Minor you don't want one in your own house. My feed is filled with uh, uh, bulldogs, bulldogs and French bulldogs. And and yeah, but yeah. it's also, you know, uh, seeing young people get married and have kids. Yeah. Because, you know, we got a teenager, so it's like, you know, uh, the, 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 <laughs> she's actually super cool and super fun. I mean, she sounds very cool. But, yeah. <laughs> but like, you know, you in your mid 50s, it's about sickness and death. I yeah. mean, it's like who's getting cancer? Who's getting this? Yeah. Who's getting that? Who's lost someone? Who's lost another person who just lost a parent? Who's lost, like it's yeah. all, you know, it's like you go through life and it's like. There's weddings and there's births and all these fun occasions. Yeah. And then like after midlife, it truly is like, enjoy it while you can, because after midlife, it's kind of like, well, you get graduations. Thank God we get graduations. <laughs> thank, thank God. But, for after, graduations. but after college graduations, yeah. then maybe a wedding, but, but like all the gatherings are part loss yeah. and, and sickness. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's a weird, weird turn. So I love seeing these people, you know. Thankfully, this film festival has been wonderful because I meet more young people because yeah. people tend to make films in their 20s and 30s. And then, like, and then you become f- follow them on Instagram and you see they're like sharing pictures of like pregnancies and sure. births. And I'm like, ah, oh, it's nice. <laughs> this is so it's nice. nice. Want me to tell you my shitty story? No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's so gloomy. Yeah, when I when I walked into Jeff's home, it's it's doom and gloom in here. There's doom cobwebs everywhere. Gloom. Not a single light. In this house, I know. I know the coffin in the living room is a bit much. Yeah, I was like, "Come on, really?" But I just—it was on sale. <laughs> You're like, "Why not?" It's going to so happen we, uh, soon. Yeah, we're going to need sooner or later. Actually, I still, even though it is against Jewish law, I kind of want to be cremated. Interesting. And put in a bunch of urns because I didn't breed my own child. I, I want to be like you know oh, all the nieces and nephews. I want to give like you know one tenth of my ashes to like 10 different people or something. That's actually kind of cool. I want to be spread around, maybe in salt shakers, whatever. And then you can like put me on your food if you need to. <laughs> no, I don't know. That, what, is that, that kosher? Do you think that's kosher? <laughs> it's probably not. It's probably, it's probably cannibalism. <laughs> is, it, is, is that cannibalism at that point? I don't know. I mean, someone would argue if, if they won't let you have a cheeseburger, they'll probably argue against <laughs> eating human ashes. <laughs> I like that thought though. That's so kind of you. Be, maybe they'll sprinkle me on maybe, their Maybe their, they'll put me on the, on the rose bushes, whatever <laughs> they want to do. But but I kind of like, I don't know. I don't really see the reason of just being buried and yeah. All that's, having a spot to visit. Well, and that's what's interesting. That process is weird. I'm so happy I'm not alive to experience being that. You know what I mean? Like, it makes no sense. But you know what I mean? Because it's weird. Putting someone in a box, weird. Burning them, weird. It's strange. But yeah. what else are you supposed to do? What do you, what do you like, like? It's so weird. We gotta do something. Gotta do and something, that's man. The whole fucking well. Now we, we've uh, gone from your films to death to everything to God. the human condition to the fact that, I mean, religion happened because of death and ancestor worship. Sure, everyone. That's why people refer to God as the Father because originally it was like you know we all think our grandparents watch over us. Sure, yeah, them, and and yeah, that's why you said God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was like. It was grandpa. Yeah. It was great, great grandpa. Yeah. You were just, every every house had its own God, which was your ancestors. We just That's ancestor worship. So you buried them and kept them around or, or, you know, in India it was like, seems like more hygienic to burn them, by the way. Yeah. I, as, I mean, I once you so. learn about like microbes and shit, like so. keeping dead bodies in the bed, but it is pretty cool. Like my first wife, her fam, half her family was from West Virginia. And okay. so actually... There's a family cemetery oh, on wow. on a farm. Like, oh, that's crazy. Like, that's kind of because right, right cool. people used to always bury your family in yeah. your own yard. Oh, that's nuts! And they still own the. And they won't let me stuff. do that here in LA. I can't get the permit. <laughs> they, they just won't. Though you you can have a pool, but no, they won't let yeah. me have I, that. I can that get plot? a permit for solar panels. Ah. 
But who you needs know. those? You need you need but a burial I wanna, plot. I want to I want to dig a plot. I want that would be <laughs> in great. The front to have yard. Two empty spots in the grass <laughs> in the front yard. And when people are like, "What's going on there?" You, uh, I'm like, "Oh, just that's that's where we're gonna be buried." Probably probably keep everyone. <laughs> We'd never. No neighbor would ever talk to us again. Uh, it's kind of, would that be kind of nice though? Do you have nice neighbors? I don't know. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know they walk their dogs. They're nice. Okay, all right, that's good. Then. We are lucky for now. So you have some there's for no, now. There's no change. asshole on the block. You never know. Not yet. Not yet. If they, if an well, asshole, when I leave, there won't be any asshole on the block. No, um. Still no. Still no. We're <laughs> asshole free. It's an asshole free zone. Is it? Have I? Have I? Distracted? Are we on too far a tangent to ever no, get back? No, no, no. Because actually, I want to. Can I? Can I comment on something real quick? Is that okay? You are allowed right? to comment. I feel like there's, yeah. there's no rules. I feel like we're tangenting a whole uh, bunch. Um, but because we were talking about you're talking about you know cremation and stuff. Yeah. Stay on this death. I know you're like God, Adam. Can we steer away from no, this? No, no. But I'm the one who pointed <laughs> out that death is a theme in your film. This is true. So it's your fault. It's, it's your totally fault. me. It's, it's your fault. I could have let that go. Um, you could have. You could have. Said I was like, let's talk about <laughs> let's the Grim it. Reaper. You know, Tim Burton did go to my school, so this all makes sense, right? Um, so when, before Men Grieving, I was reading, I became obsessed with this book um, called uh, Consuming, Consuming Grief, okay? I get, and it's, it's kind of like an academic book, so it's not like the f- most fun read, but the, the person who wrote it, um, the woman, she's, uh, her name's Beth A. Beth A. Conklin, I believe, and... She was exploring tribes um, in the Amazon, and I believe it was specifically to see how they grieve. I might be wrong on this. The book is very dense, but there is some really incredible stuff in there if you can kind of get in there. I mean, she's a good writer, but it's kind of academic stuff. Um, And she found that, like, certain tribes in the Amazon would – would engage in endo cannibalism, not exo cannibalism, right? So endo I mean that they would eat their own only when they would die as a way to it's, it's so fascinating to move on, to be able to move on yeah, from the grief and complete because, the connection. Yeah, complete a connection and then also just do this thing where it's like as soon as you start eating something, it now takes on a different life. It's no longer your mom, your son, your daughter. It's Food, even though it would make them sick and make them feel nasty, it was it, like, like they, they they'd constantly throw up. It wasn't like a, it wasn't healthy for them to eat these mm. bodies, because um, especially after they've been dead and they kind of have to wait for tribes to kind of come um, and witness this. Uh, but they would do it because it allowed them to move on to know that hey, they're no, this person is no longer alive, and us consuming parts of them, they wouldn't eat like the whole thing, but they'd eat parts, um, which sounds like to us, like, whoa, that's, like, intense, it allowed them to disconnect and to move on quickly or quicker through the grieving process, right? And so as soon as, you know, the white man came, right, um, we were horrified by this this act of, um, you know, that, uh, that seems uncivilized, right? And they no longer are allowed to, to practice this cannibalism, right? And it's it's endo cannibalism, something way different than like what's advertised. Is, and I'm not I don't I'm not an expert in this. Some uh, who knows maybe some people are practicing exo cannibalism, eating other folks, right? Um, but but this endo cannibalism was part of this this the mourning process for these people. So when we kind of came and said, hey, you can't do that anymore. Um, it's fascinating. She was there and was able to interview people that were from the before time when you could. And uh, there's this amazing amazing quote and. Or she's interviewing someone, and they go, you know, I I miss I miss the days when um, we could eat the bodies, because then I wouldn't be so sad. And it's like, whoa, that is just like, and it's so it's so fascinating. It kind of informed men grieving to a degree, even though you're like, to what to what way? Because we don't we have such a limited view in in the Western world. And I'm even going to say just in the United States of how someone should grieve. Right? There's no like right way or wrong way to go about doing this thing, right? It's so fascinating that every culture, even person to person, has a different way of processing this kind of stuff, right? And that's that's what kind of near the, the climax of my film, what happens, um, it looks like one thing, but the the consuming I 
near the end, that, this doesn't spoil anything for anyone that's gonna that would see it. Uh, Men agree that two men consume each other's grief. There's an act of consumption between the two of them um, that can, looks like one thing. Cause it's, so the play has like, wow, what's going on here? But there's also another thing happening here, and it's such a fragile moment that it's broken instantly as soon as someone else comes into the room. Um, these two men are sharing a, a moment of intimacy, if you will, to some degree. Um, it sounds like very shady. It's like, oh, this two guys fucking no, but um, but 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 it really inspires this. But yeah, 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 yeah. But it's it's, that's the post credit. No, I I I I do get what you're saying. Yeah, and 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 I guess maybe I don't know. I'm sure there'd be some people who would say I'm too open minded or whatever. But no, what what you say? It's clearly all these all these traditions. What we think is normal is just encultured. Yes, and. And like I, I always, I'm always reminded of uh, whichever Douglas Adams book of Hitchhiker's Guide, Great books. where they're the restaurant at the end of the universe. Oh, that's like the when the one, cow think, yeah. when the cow comes to the table and they have a conversation with it, and the guy from Earth is like, "I can't eat a cow now that I've I can't eat now that I've met you," and the cow just goes. You'd rather me to eat a cow you never met. You'd rather eat a stranger. And it's like just yeah, culturally, it could be the if if. Every culture, if the cultures that dominated Earth were like, yeah. the best thing to do with a dead loved one is cook and eat them, and then their cellular energy enters you and becomes part of you, and they're with you forever, and you can just move on. Like, yeah. like, 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 if that were the norm, then the not eating people would be looked at as like, what are you doing? That's like, crazy, it's horrifying. Yeah, like, the fact that endo cannibalism, which I just learned today, mm-hmm. there you go, yeah. is, is sure horrifying to. Small-minded people, sure, well, I mean, yeah. You can talk about judgy, but yeah. <laughs> but 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 there, it does make sense, and it's just and you know just like you know I tried explaining to this guy, I keep mentioning the kid, but like I, you know, why do you think men have short hair and women have long hair? It's just culture. It's if it, 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 sure. it could easily be the opposite, one hundred percent. And it just somehow these traditions got locked in, and 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 we what we think is normal is just taught. A hundred percent. So it's, it's just kind of, it's just wild, right? I don't know. It's, yeah. just, it's a weird, I know we went on this weird, it's a related yeah. tangent, but I felt like, I thought that was such a wild story because I didn't, I had such a perception of that That's a great, yeah, that, that is. Stuff. And, and so, and, and by the way, that tells me another thing about you as a creator and a creative person <laughs> is that you do this weird thing called reading. Yeah. Isn't that fascinating? So, so, so <laughs> by reading these sources instead of just, but by the way, uh, this is gonna. I mean, there's nothing wrong with a cinephile being a, a filmmaker. Sure, yeah, yeah. But when all the inspirations are from other movies, you know, Tarantino does it pretty well. But, yeah, but yeah, a lot yeah, of yeah. people, a lot of times, if, if you see, uh, well, at the festival level, I get very uninterested in films that just remind me of films I've already seen because I'm like, you're making an indie film, you might as well do something we haven't seen before. Like, yeah, like. You're not going to make a better, uh, you know, Tarantino sp- film. Yeah. Or Spielbergian or, film. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. If you're, you're going to like, you know, odds are you should do something we haven't seen a hundred times. Right. And or we strive for and, that. Yeah. And when you do weird things like read books or talk to other people or, or learn or, you know, learn about traditions and religions and stuff like, like then, then the work is informed by something and you get something that, that, hasn't been submitted a thousand times and seen a yeah. thousand times. Or at least I mean, there's a different, it's in a different container to a degree. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't want to sit here and say like, yeah, oh, this is like there's been never been a new story. Thing. Yeah. It's yeah. like, yeah, of, of course there's always something, but you can tell when a creative person exposes themselves to more. Yeah. That's all. And, 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 you know, there's something I think worth yeah, it's like one of those things where it's like I. It is like that thing where it's like I. I would encourage, like I. Even, I had to encourage myself to do this to kind of go out and because I, I. I do watch tons of films, right? But then I also have to realize there's there's so much to be offered just by. This sounds so lame. Just going on a walk, going to the gym, listening to a conversation. Like once you're like on on track with a story or something that you're wanting to pursue, it's wild how like the things start popping up in your life again like over here in that conversation at the gym of those guys like i was in the process of writing men grieving and these two awkward older men have that conversation and it's like this is 
would I have li- been listening to this if I wasn't working on this pro- You know what I mean? Like, I think once you start opening yourself up to different avenues to receive, like, information, because um, I woke up from a, this sounds insane, Jeff, I swear to God this happened. I woke up from a dream. I never dream. I usually just, like, black out, right, when I sleep. Um, I woke up from a dream, and I had this, I couldn't remember anything. All I could remember was, was, um, Someone was saying something about consuming grief. I'm like, wow, I've never heard that before. Typed into Google, found that book, started reading that book. Like, it's just like, I think once you're like in it with a story or you feel like there's something there and you're like writing and you're on track with something, things will start popping up. I mean, like, that's insane to sit here and say, dreaming it and then finding a book. I I could go the practical route and say, you know, once you're thinking along some terms, then you start noticing more. Yes, yeah. You start noticing more. Yeah. Or I could joke that, well, we're in a simulation that was programmed by someone a little lazy. And so, you know, you you start seeing too many of the same car and you're like, okay, so they, this, well, I hit the part of the code that like is reusing things. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. That's probably what is, happened for me more so. This is, you know, I don't know. I joke too much about the simulation thing. It's getting old, but. I support it. It's, we uh, don't know. We can either confirm nor deny. And it doesn't, doesn't change anything. <laughs> it doesn't actually. So it's like irrelevant. If, if, uh, if. The creator of the universe did so by typing on a keyboard yeah. and, cre- and then hitting enter and the Big Bang happened. I don't know. I don't have a problem with this. So this is where we start talking about the Matrix. Uh, the one Matrix. through three. Oh, actually, the fourth as well. Oh, I didn't get through the fourth. I you didn't don't get through think. it? You didn't like Sabebe? I don't know. Sabebe was, was just the weird creature that Keanu Reeves touches his head next to. I can't remember. Sabebe. <laughs> I was in shock I couldn't get through it because I normally can just like do it. But you hate right, it. Well, we're never talking about other yeah, films. Yeah, I know. I'm so sorry. So I'm gonna I know, jump, I know. No, I'm going <laughs> to jump on this to say that, that we have to stop just so that we can get to your four questions answers. Got it. And talk about other films. Got it. It sounds like Passover now, the qu- the, the four questions or yeah, whatever. Right? That, that. You get it. You get it. I know some people, every once in a while, uh, 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 a Hebraic person notices yeah. the four questions thing. It wasn't intentional. It was actually, it was, it was born from, I have a friend who's a professional session drummer. Oh, and, cool. And so... His whole and he's also a gigantic tough man, and so he likes to As have arguments. Are. He likes to argue. He's a doorman. There we go. Okay, and uh, doorman slash drummer. Oh, <laughs> and yeah, anyway, the toughest. He always uh, goes. The tough. He always goes like Neil Peart's the most overrated drummer of all time. Debate me. <laughs> like that's that's his idea of a Facebook post. <laughs> that is wild. The Rolling Stones suck ass. Convince me I'm wrong. <laughs> you know. Or or he just goes so who's the, or he'll go who's the most overrated band of all time? Okay, I like that's a little more open. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's why I have the overrated question in the list because I'm like I'm gonna take James's questions mm-hmm. and apply them to film, and I was gonna put them at the end of the podcast like James Lipton's ending. Oh yeah, yeah, then, yeah, yeah. But then obviously I like shooting the shit too much. I know. And then it adds another half hour to the podcast, and then you're asking people, well, why don't you just sit down and listen to like. <laughs> You know, and then once you finish listening, let's yeah, add on another twenty minutes. So that's why we'll make it its own. Like deal. Once you're Adam, uh, talk an hour about himself. And <laughs> God. Let's let's find out what his four favorite. Movies well, it's, uh, yeah, and let's and let's go back in time to your your earliest memory. No, so anyway, <laughs> yeah, so like, oh God, so I will, I will. Uh, is there a social media website or anything people should check out? Yeah, um, just I, I honestly the Instagram. It's at Big Duck Picks. All P- Picks is P I X. Yeah, that's that's really it. All obviously one word. Um, that's where I'm like kind of posting updates, what's going on, what's happening with the movies and stuff. Um, Sherman Oaks is on there. I posted something a while ago. Eight, well, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Oh no, so, no. I yeah. mean, I, I, like, I, I know was, there's someone. There, I was yeah. going to sarcastically say. I mean, yeah. you do post from other festivals, but that's yeah. forgiven. <laughs> it's not exclusively uh, just Sherman Oaks. You know, I mean, when when there are twelve thousand festivals in the world, according to Film Freeway, yeah, it's insane. like I'm aware that people will cheat. Yeah, but I guess it's really not cheating. <laughs> I just have a lot of partners when it well, comes to film also, festivals. If, if I, you know, <laughs> I would need to win the lottery and and start, you know, uh, a thousand festivals in a thousand different cities so that people could cover the whole That's, earth. Why don't you just do that? I should, I want to buy a lottery ticket today. I don't <laughs> buy the tickets is the problem. That is, that is the... It is, by the way, sad that... Well, it's funny. I have been talking to people. People have always... 
the intention of Film Invasion Los Angeles was mm-hmm. to have Film Invasion San Francisco, Film Invasion this, Film Invasion that. Oh, that makes sense. I like and that. And there was a gentleman who was interested in doing Film Invasion London, but I'm not, I'm still... Emails. What's emails have been exchanged. Okay, that's good. Which means it probably won't happen, but maybe. <laughs> it's not, like his first response on. was, wait, who's this? What's going on? Like, we've never- right, so he was a... Uh, uh, one of your ancestors, a Frenchman. Uh, oh, someone God, the who worst. Lives, someone who lives in France suggested, met someone in London okay. and said, hey, I want to introduce you to this London guy because he kind of feels like the British Jeff. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. What, what is the British Jeff like? Does he just have a British accent? A horrible person. <laughs> He's just a piece know, of everyone shit. hates him. Everyone hates him <laughs> like me. It's just like, would you shut the fuck up and <laughs> stop interrupting people? Uh, uh, all right. You were reading my mind then. I was gonna. I know, no, <laughs> I, I, absolutely I, not. At least when I interrupt, I say, "I hate doing it, but I gotta <laughs> interrupt." Uh, at this point, I gotta interrupt. Yeah, please and get us out of here. Yeah, I know. This so been... I will. Uh, I will name. Well, first of all, people should watch. They should rush out to film festivals. They should follow your Instagram That's and right. see Men Grieving on a big screen. Yeah. Wherever you go. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's going to be screened at the end of October in L.A. End of October in yeah. L.A.? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just go on my thing and you'll see. I don't want to promote another festival on this podcast. I don't know. Not happening. But I'll promote my Instagram. I don't know. You want to say name it? Uh, who's in uh, the end of October? Uh, new Filmmakers Los Angeles. It's going to be screening. LA. Yeah, yeah. Um, Is that one downtown or something? Yeah, it's South Park Center, um, which I don't know. I've never been there. Is that I don't know that because because there there's that Regal near Staples yes. that has places. Is they, that, is they that do, called South Park Center now? No, that's I think that's something else. That's I don't a, know, I know what. There's so many. There's so many things. But New Filmmakers LA, it's going to be twenty first of October, I believe. Um, and I'll be coming back. I have a nice little thing. I'm going to be in, at the Eastern Oregon Film Festival two days. Right before then, and I'm going to fly up there, fly down. I am admittedly envious of the small town sort of off the beaten path festivals because I feel like they're kind of cool. Those communities support their festivals. Eastern Oregon is like when you're in the know of film festivals, and like for indie film festivals, it's like it's like Jim Cummings, like uh, Thunder Road guy. Do you know that director? Swears by like the Eastern Oregon Film Festival. And they're like, they're fan- it, and they have their own, they have all these like weird, cool things lined up. The community all comes out to support. But it is, it's like this, it is a different, it's a small town. You know, yeah, it's, it's so it's different. It's not LA. It's right? so different. Yeah. I know. But you, I'm giving you a comment. Sherman Oaks feels like a small town. I think I said that in my review. Maybe. I, I and I think, I think it's even in our, st- I'm being serious. It might be in our film freeway description, something along the lines of like, you know, a neighborhood festival in a big city. It feels like that because because and that's not me like because I'm here saying it, but it truly does. And those are the ones that I feel like for someone like me, because I like connecting with the people there. Right. Or at least trying to want to talk. I want to see like who's programming this. Like I want I'd love to like I love to chat with folks. As you can see, I've been talking for fucking hours on this thing. Um but it is just the small town festivals are are the ones where you actually get to make like real genuine connections with people as opposed to like sometimes the the bigger glitzier ones or whatever not to throw shade at them but then you're just kind of treated like it's a different vibe yeah you're treated like an, um, a cattle and you're brought in yeah. and brought out and you don't make yeah. yeah you don't bond it's cool to get actually, in but the, like the podcast i recorded before this one or two before this uh from 22, Sherman Oaks 2022, just like oh, you. Yeah, yeah. But uh, their next project, they're collaborating with a cinematographer they met in their block. Oh, see, that's, aw- that's awesome. See, that... Actually, not their block. They just went to that block and saw it. See, that's that is that's the best, right? Was, and it was at Sherman Oaks? Is that Sherman Oaks see, Film and, Festival. And it wouldn't, if that was... If, if you... Because the festival is a big deal, I think, right? But, like, if you were to, um, I guess, like plan out the festival in a different way it wouldn't feel you know what i mean you you make it it all feels so intentional you give the filmmakers like it's for filmmakers like it's for like your champion it's, it's, of filmmakers it's, it's geared towards filmmakers. that and it's geared towards and yeah and when you have a nice longer q a then people have something to come up and talk to you about afterwards like, yeah whereas otherwise it's just like hey i liked your film like if you even know who the director was of the film you just saw. Totally. Yeah. And it's some really special that you give everyone the time. Um, because like it makes me immediately I, I like everybody like that's there, but like in my block, I immediately like everyone even more because I'm like, oh my God, these people are like 
so funny. Like, so like you, you just get to see their personality as like a, yeah, as a, I know it, it's so great. What, what, how you, how you do it. So, and we have, and it's nice cause we just care about quality. So Lord knows I won't bother asking you about the whole experience of when you go to a festival and you're in a block and like there's shitty films in your block oh, man. and it's yeah. like, it's a gut punch. It kind of sucks. Cause it's like, well, if they thought that was good, then like, what? Are we, what like, then do I pull these laurels off? Like, yeah, yeah, no, like it is. A, it's like a whole. It's like a thing, man. Where it's like, ah, it, it's rough. It's rough. But it never once felt like that. And I plan on going to more. I only went. I think I only went to my block for your for last year's. Cause I, that's because I was going to be out of town literally the next day. So I plan on going. I'm going to try to go every day. It's, I went that uh, another one. It, it is. Uh, I would. I. I stand by it. You wouldn't see a bad film. You wouldn't be doing it if you'd... Yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, so I'm like, yeah. of course, I, I, I want to. Because I was able to do that with um, this Summer Shorts Festival which in, up in New Paltz, New York. Um, when it was able to go every day, it was, the, it was the best, absolute best to do. All right, well, the thing I didn't yeah. let myself say while we were recording, but I'll just say it is... No, I'll say it after we stop. Are you sure? All right. Yeah, yeah. No, I'll, I'll share. It's just, it's just a dream of mine. Okay. That, but I'm going to make sure I go. I'm not going to do anything to happen. Oh, no, oh, no. Every day. I mean, because some... I had such a great... I, I, it was so much fun um, that I'm, I'm really excited. It is good people, good films. Yeah. Weather, 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 Weatherman but... Grieving's in, in, in... Seriously, this is like... I'm not even... Like, Sherman Oaks, it, it is so good. And I know Men Grieving's an acquired taste. So that's why I'm like, even if it's not in there, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to sport. I honestly, well, I, I honestly, <laughs> don't even. We got an overwhelming number of films. This year's yeah, crazy. I know, but I know, but yeah, anyhow, it's yeah, I'm not even. Yeah, but, that's but, Jeff but saying. You got, but you got Jeff the programmer saying, in your back pocket, so true. you know if I got to put my finger on the scale. But anyway, it's like that's Jeff saying it's not it. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm sure, I know. far from it. That's <laughs> not what I said. <laughs> anyhow, <laughs> twenty minutes ago, I, I got Adam to share uh, at Big Duck Picks. Oh yeah, Big Duck P I X. Yes, on Instagram if mm-hmm. you want to follow him, and I'm just bringing it up again so I can spiel off do all it. the uh, all the stuff that people should do. First of all, thank you, Adam. Yes, thank, thank you, you. Adam, for listening. If you're listening to this, please like and subscribe to the podcast. Maybe even write a review somewhere. Hell yeah, I don't know. why not? And uh, if you want to learn more about this podcast, go to discoverindiefilm.com. It's at DIF Wins on social media, everywhere. And by the way, there's a TV series born out of this podcast because I kept talking to filmmakers and everyone who made a feature was on streaming and everyone who made a short was on YouTube with like 10 billion other videos. So on Amazon Prime Video, if you go to a Prime Video on a nice big ass TV, you can type in Discover Indie Film. It auto-completes pretty quickly. And there are currently seven seasons. Each wow. one is 10 episodes, half hour-ish episodes of, you know, normally two to four shorts. Sometimes there's one 40-minute short. Sometimes there's four 10-minute shorts, whatever. But Incredible. So that's a TV series of short films handpicked from the festival circuit. So please uh, support it. It used to be included with Prime. And we were up to 10,000 unique viewers a week. And Amazon did what's called Indie Curry. We ended up 99 cents an episode, 7.99 a season. And so less viewers that way. But I have to say, when was the last time you spent $8 to watch 24 short films? Like, like it's, it's not a bad way to spend $8. Like, you can have a coffee and a croissant, or you can support 20 plus indie films. I support that. I like that. And you're and you're 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 picking these films, yes? Picking the films, but you know they're gonna be good. The funny thing is, I'm picking all the films, and then I handed season eight off to a wonderful programmer from a dance film festival who had me be a best a guest curator, a dance film festival in England. And I said, Oh my God, these dance films are gorgeous. Do you want to do an all dance season of this kind of uh, discover new films? She said, Yes. We put it together. We uploaded it, and Amazon said, oh, We're gonna pass. Uh, or they, 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 I guess 10 episodes of wordless dance films. I don't Which know. They have a say in what you're... Well, I guess they have a say. Well, they have a say. I know. Yeah, but I thought like by like, season 8, they pretty much let me do anything I wanted. So, that's good. Yeah, because I was going to be cool. The dance films are so fucking good. So the dance films are going to have to end up on TV High, which will be the last thing I mentioned. So next thing I mentioned... <laughs> So many kind words about Sherman Oaks Film Festival. We hold it every November. This year it's November 29th, 2023. If you want to come check it out, we're at the beautiful cinema in Glendale, California. Give me credit. And learn more at ShermanOaksFF.com. At ShermanOaksFF on social media. It does have a sister 
Culture Festival that we hold every June, film, and days in Los Angeles. You can learn more about that if you go to filminvasionla.com and it's Film Invasion LA on social media. I think I mentioned TV High well enough in the intro. Just go to watchtvhigh.com. Kick that shit. And we even have Can of Comedy on there now and some other stuff. Oh, and cool. and uh, yeah, because I'm not watching stand up. And we're we're going to start doing our own, I think, stand up shows with undiscovered comics and then putting them on. Putting their bits on. That's really cool. Yeah. Oh man, look at you. Finding, you're like, uh, yeah, you're doing this whole. You're, so you're succeeding. I really, I'm, I'm succeeding at. I'm trying to keep my head above water. You're doing it. I can. I gotta, you know, I gotta. You're, you're just. You're barely choking on some water right now, but you're I, all right. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 well, I'm underwater, but I do have a straw. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a bendy straw. A baby, a little. Yeah, the swizzle stick. <laughs> yeah. is above the. But I'm like, I just gotta get it. Well, anyway. <laughs> Adam Peltier, thank you so much. Oh my gosh. Everyone should check out your work. And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you, guys. Yeah.